roll this bunch. Okay. Good morning. Welcome to your last day of budget hearings. Hooray. <laughs> we have three presentations for you today. We'll be starting with the Technology Review Board. It starts on page 607 with the summary. I'll turn it over to Wes. Thank you, Lorian. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, Wes. Wes Ellington, Chief Information Officer, here this morning to discuss with you the decision packages for the 2020 budget that were approved by the Technology Review Board. First slide I wanted to, to, to bring up is just an overall summary of all the decision packages that uh, we're asking for budget authority on. They, they are listed in priority. In other words, from, a, from an IT uh, security standpoint, <clears throat> the, the top one is, is our highest priority. And then obviously the one at the bottom is, is the lowest priority. So they are ranked in order of what we perceive as the most important uh, item to consider. First item I'd like to discuss is the core firewall refresh. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sedgwick County's core firewalls require replacement due to end of life estimates. These systems have been standardized on to support all new project implementations as well as existing ones. These systems are a key element in the county's defense in depth strategy to protect data systems on the network from vulnerabilities. This strategy has given the county the ability to provide extended connectivity while staying secure and compliant with KCGIS and PCI requirements. This request for $116,192 is a one-time cost to replace the hardware that make up a portion of this landscape. Next item is the <clears throat> primary backup system refresh. The current primary backup solution was implemented in 2015 this is the primary backup platform for all county enterprise database applications and data for all county departments. In 2020, at an age of five plus years, data growth will have exceeded the capacity of the system and the technology supporting the system will be out of date <clears throat> and, and no longer supported. Costs provided are estimates based on previous uh, similar hardware, but will become more exact as the time approaches. This request is a one-time cost for $360,000 to replace the existing system. The third, <clears throat> third item is PC replacement cycle and windows end of life. In the past, budgets for PC replacement fell on individual departments and program areas. With inception of the Technology Review Board, IT is looking to consolidate technology spending for the replacement of PC systems throughout the county based on an eight-year cycle. This request is to fund the first phase of this strategy of PC replacement for those PCs that will not run the new OS version that the county currently will use. This request is to establish a budget for yearly PC replacement for Sedgwick County. The life cycle of systems proposed is eight years with one-eighth being replaced each year. <laughs> this is an attempt to stay ahead of the OS depreciation and hardware, fa hardware failures. This request for $582,571 would be a one-time cost to get the current inventory updated with a reoccurring request of $325,000 per year to replace one-eighth of the total number of PCs on the county's network on a cycle. That's not to say that, I'll just add a little bit to this, that's not to say that we would spend the $325,000, it's just budget authority, so worst case scenario, if we had to spend up to and replace all hardware, we have the budget authority to do so. Most of the time, a lot of the PCs, we, we do uh, analysis on the processor and the memory, which is the most important things when running an o a new OS, and we can a lot of times just uh, spend a little bit of money, put memory in it, upgrade the memory, and the PC is still uh, viable to run the new OS. So it, it's basically a case-by-case -case scenario that we'll run through and make that determination whether it needs to be a total replacement of the PC or just upgrading a component of the PC. <clears throat> Next item is the wireless system update. The county is currently running a wireless controller and access control system for the county wireless system that is in need of updating to continue to provide current wireless services. There are approximately 50 access points that are in production that are no longer supported past this version included in the estimated costs of this assessment 
which prevents us from upgrading and being able to take advantage of the new features. Once this goes into support in August, on August 31st, 2020, the county will be unable to upgrade code on the wireless controllers, support the access points, or provide secure connections wirelessly. This request for 250000 is to upgrade the necessary components for the wireless service. In the past, wireless, this system is about nine years old as well. <clears throat> wireless was a convenience, but in this day and age, it's become such an important part of the business process. For example, the, the sheriff's squad room, as those squad cars pull into that parking lot, it's all hooked up on the wireless system so that those videos automatically start uploading into the wireless access points downtown to our current uh, data center at 510. So wireless is a, is a pretty important component of our infrastructure landscape at this point. Next item is tax system maintenance. This is the Aumentum system. This request is for funding to cover a portion of the software hardware maintenance fees for the county's tax application system outside of the Information and Technology 2020 budget allocation. It will help to maintain a viable tax system that is up to date with new patches and enhancements that not just address technology changes, but also changes in the application to address county tax process changes. For this system, most customizations related to how the tax process works in this jurisdiction are developed and implemented by the vendor. This request for 285000 is to continue to provide support and maintenance for the tax system. <clears throat> Next item is the Senior Customer Support Analyst. Over the past four years, IT customer support volume has increased by over 3,023 calls, 2,539 emails, and an increase in heat break fix requests by 6,832. IT is also experiencing a continual increase in external access by fire and law enforcement municipalities, vendors, subscriber access, with over 595 non-county users currently active. <clears throat> Due to the increased ticket load, customer support is currently at a 4.92 average day open ticket scenario up from 2015's average of 2.61 days per ticket. By adding a customer support staff member and assigning this FTE specifically to work in the sheriff's office, work can be spread back out to current field CSAs, hopefully bringing that statistic back down to around that 2.92 uh, average. This request is for $73,914 to provide budget authority to add one FTE to the CSA IT staff. On behalf of EMS, this is a request to replace the EMS mobile gateways. This project replaces the current mobile gateways, GPS routers, and EMS vehicles. These current devices are reported to be at their end of life cycle in 2018. These devices are a critical part of EMS technology and the county attempts to achieve a high availability of 99.999% uptime. This connection supplies GPS, vehicle location, to our 911 CAD dispatcher center and feeds EMS mobile area routing and vehicle location information to the EMS application system via a two-way connection that 911 utilizes to dispatch the closest unit by time, as well as considerations for time of day <clears throat> and day of week. It also gives turn-by-turn -turn directions using Sedgwick County GIS map data via the mobile computer terminals or MCTs that are in the vehicles. The router services as an access point AP to allow data from the devices including EKG monitors to be uploaded as part of the patient care report that the county is mandated by the state to, co to be completed for every patient. This request is for 111,681 to replace all aging units in, in the ambulance units. On behalf of CDDO, uh, CDDO electronic medical records replacement. The current electronic health record software used by SCDDO will no longer be supported by the, count, by the current vendor as of April 2020. SCDDO must maintain detailed records of how and when the functions of a CDDO are performed and, are, and archive 
all related documents. SCDDO is not a self-direct service provider. Rather, the division works with individuals to assist them in assessing needed funding and or services through available resources and network of nearly 50 providers. Currently, there are approximately 2,500 individuals eligible for funding and or services that CDDO tracks. Of those, approximately 2,100 individuals receive one or more services and may be waiting for access to additional resources. The remaining individuals receive no services and are waiting for access to local or state funded resources. SCDDO is requesting budget authority for the replacement and ongoing maintenance of a new software solution that will meet the unique needs of this division. The request also includes funding for any hardware upgrades needed to ensure successful implementation of the selected product. SCDDO is currently working with representatives from my staff as well as purchasing to draft an RFP to solicit bids. <clears throat> the request is for 200000 to implement it with a reoccurring maintenance cost estimated at 100000 for maintenance and support. Next item is on-base maintenance funding request for increase. In 2018, the county expanded its use of on-base, which is the enterprise uh, document management uh, application that we use here at the county, as a result of a county manager-driven project to increase the efficiency of the agenda and contract management project. Additional modules were purchased, contract management and agenda management, as well as 30 workflow licenses. This caused the annual maintenance for the on-base to increase by 36000 in 2019. There is an additional adjustment yearly for maintenance, trending at, at an average of 3%. IT has been able to absorb the annual increase, but will, with the additional modules, it has put a significant strain on the current budget and has required resources to be redirected from other needs. This request for 40000 is to cover the increased maintenance costs due to implementation of the contract management. Success factors, human capital management and payroll. The Cedric County System for Financials, Accounting, Human Resources, and Payroll will fall off of mainstream maintenance on 1231 of 2025. At that time, annual maintenance payments will increase substantially, roughly 54%, <clears throat> and would stay at a higher rate until the system was upgraded. To avoid these increased costs, as well as to stay current with the new functionality and, and requirements of this system, ERP needs to upgrade this system to the next release. The next release of ERP software splits the current functionality of ECC into two separate systems, one for financial accounting and one for HR payroll. This decision package is being submitted to requ request additional budget authority in 2020 of $345,000 to perform the HR payroll side of the upgrade and for additional, additional budget authority of $300,000 in years 2021 and beyond for additional licensing and subscription fees. Next item is success factors, recruiting and onboarding. <clears throat> On behalf of HR, Human Resources Division ERP is requesting additional 2020 budget authority of $160,320 to support the recruiting and onboarding solution. Of that, $141,120 will be used to renew the licensing and subscription fees for both recruiting and onboarding solution and the DocuSign electronic signature functionality. 19,200 will be used to renew licensing subscriptions and carrier fees for the SMS text functionality of the system. <clears throat> Next item is network switch updates. Many switches have been purchased throughout the years by individual departments and program areas and have never been upgraded. These, this request is to upgrade and replace older switches that have either gone long past end of life or will go end of life by 2020. Some switches go back at least 12 years and the technology supporting the switches is out of date and no longer, su no longer support capabilities. Costs provided in this decision package are estimates based off previous pricing estimates of similar hardware, but will become more exact as the time approaches. This request for $124,135 is to replace these switches throughout the Cedric County network. The last item is the EMS and FIRE iPad replacement cycle on behalf of EMS and FIRE. EMS and FIRE staff make use of tablets for specific applications to interpatient data and capture information with signatures while out in the field. 
Fire uses the iPad for firehouse inspectors, and EMS uses the specific patient data gathering. These accompany the trucks when responding to emergencies. The tablet hardware is estimated to last four years in production. Eventually, the battery will stop holding a charge, and the hardware will be too old to support the current version of the OS or applications that are needed. This request is for 10500 per year reoccurring to replace on a, on a schedule uh, any aging units. And again, that's the summary, and I'll stand for any questions that you may have. Questions for what? I, I still wonder how some of this is being pulled from other departments and how we can see. I mean, because when you look at it, it's like 2.6 million bucks that we just have to come up with, but that's not really the case, right? There are some costs in other departments. We're working on identifying those. They'll probably take <coughs> some time still to okay. figure out exactly how much they've been paying. Okay. Commissioner Hill? Yeah, I, I appreciate the, uh, the summary and good job explaining everything so far, but um, on top of the 2.659 million, there was also some FTEs. Is there a summary of that? How many FTEs total? <coughs> you technology, answer? technology, excuse me. <clears throat> Technology Re Review Board has one, okay. and then when I did my presentation specifically for IT, right. we had one. I th okay, so but that was an existing FTE with staff. Correct. We're, yeah. So on the front end of the book here, there's decision packages summary, and the total, if I'm reading this correctly, was 5.5 million and 40 FTE. And your other request is buried in that. Okay, but is this 2.6 in addition to the 5.5? No. Is this is already built into your launch. It's built in. Good. Okay. And so I think that answers my question. That's the it's very good to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, can, I, can I follow up with that? Because I, I, I was going to ask the same. So I'm looking in those decision package page, whatever it is, one, two, three. So any one of these items is not listed in there in pages one, two, three that I see. It is not. And all of the TRB requests on, are on your long sheet line. Help me out here. <coughs> I guess to clarify, so you, so to follow up with Jim's question, so well, if the five point five million includes the two point six million here. It does not. Oh. The two point six million is already built into the long sheet line twenty nine on your long sheet. The 5.5 is in addition to that. So if you look at your long sheet and you see where see we're it. set today, and I'll kind of go over this this afternoon too. Okay. We're already set today as as this discussion is going on with about a $1.359 million deficit for 2020. <coughs> TRB is in that deficit number. The 5.5 million, all the decision packages, everything you're hearing has not been built in yet. There's, there's, this is new. This is our first year for TRB discussion during budget. It was done out of necessity to try to wrangle in IT <coughs> function, charges, staffing, everything that these 40 plus departments are running out there. We're trying to build a semblance of order into this IT. So we're in the, this is the first go at that. And to get the, back to Commissioner Cruz's comment, we know there are embedded monies in this organization for IT equipment and software and people, and we are going through the budget and trying to find that and move it to Wes's shop, to, to IT where it belongs. Okay. Um, so that, that's, kind of, that's kind of phase one is we're funding it this year and then phase two and we've talked about it, and this will come up in a legislative discussion we need a mechanism within the county to begin to put monies into an account which we can't we do not have the authority to do today we need legislative work to get that done so where we can begin to fund and cache money aside to deal with the ongoing IT challenges of this organization Carly is working on a spreadsheet to get to Commissioner Dennis's question from a year ago of what are we spending in this organization on IT 
and she is working on that real time and we're up to just short of 19 million dollars a year and we're not quite finished there yet but we're approaching 20 million dollars a year on what this organization spends on technology and and it's going to continue to grow and grow and when you put cameras on sheriff's deputies and you put all of these mobile functionalities out in EMS and fire trucks and police and sheriff's cars it continues to grow and Wes is having to just absorb that right now we're, so we're trying to figure out a better way to manage that so we're in a phase one of about a three phase process so this is uh, so if we if we didn't have IT concerns we would be looking at a five million cap or uh, decision package there's still 5.5 .5 million dollars of decision packages and we're hoping that some of what Wes has presented is buried in there, but we don't know exactly how much. Right. And this is the first year that we're trying to do that. Correct. Which I agree with. I wish you had done it a few years ago. Right. <laughs> I know. But. <laughs> so, are we are we challenged with saying what's more important, the 2.4 million or 5.1 million? They're all competing with each other. And so it's not necessarily look at your TRB and look at your decision packages and look at compensation and look at it's it's all just one big package and yeah, I, though I Tom you. likes to say it'll be staff budgets, he will have the pleasure of presenting a recommended budget to you okay. that sorts through <coughs> all those priorities and tries to do that for the organization okay. in concert with what you tell us your priorities are. So it's important. It's a fun that, time of year. Right. So it's important that we digest each department's request and balance that with Cause, cause we'll functions of IT. Is we, and we'll go over this a little bit this afternoon. We have an hour or so built in this afternoon okay. to kind of summarize this. Okay. We, we will go back as a, as a budget team and we will come forward with a budget. And what's important for you guys as we go over this with you to make sure that what you want is in there compared to what we want. It's not important what we want. We're going to try to build a budget that's fiscally sound, that has the priorities as we see it, but you guys can come in and modify that. So it's important that you have a good lay of the land and what's out there and what's important to you and, and, and you'll get a couple of chances to walk the halls and then we'll have an eighth floor one-on-one -on -one meeting with you. You'll get a couple of chances to come in and weigh in yet. Okay. Good. Um, good. You thank, you. No, thank you. Thank you. First of all, let me say that I am very pleased that we're trying to get all of the IT budget in one place so we really know what we're spending on IT. That was my question before. I don't know what we're really spending on IT. And then we had little pockets where we had people actually embedded in different departments that were performing IT functions and they were doing things that were impacting uh, our backbone of our system. And uh, we, they could go out and buy things that were going to impact Wes's uh, job. and. He was finding out about it uh, after it was impacted, and so I, I truly believe that we're going the right direction. Yes. Now, what I'm going to say next, uh, don't take it for 2020, okay? But let's look at it beyond 2020, because uh, I'm not going to upset the apple cart right now, okay? Uh, but the other concern that I have uh, is I don't know if maybe we could use some people that are database administrators here on our staff. And the reason I say this is that uh, yesterday we heard that uh, Correction needs $260,000 a year to maintain a database that we bought. Uh, today, just looking through this, the tax system needs $285,000 just to maintain their system. CDDO needs $200,000 to maintain their medical records. Uh, Success Factors needs $345,000 and $160,000 to maintain their, their system. So what I'm seeing is that uh, we buy a, a package, and I don't know how the contractor set up, so we're going to have to involve contracting in this thing to see if we have to uh, pay for them to maintain these databases. Uh, but the question I asked yesterday with, uh, with corrections is that uh, once we bought this package, uh, uh, are they entering the data? No, they're not entering any data. Uh, are they uh, coming down maintaining our computer system? Doesn't sound like they're doing that. They're just uh, maintaining our database for us to keep that current and that requires a database administrator uh, the numbers I read off is well over a million dollars for next year alone uh, that we're paying for database administration uh, and I don't know if it's possible to do it here 
uh, or not. That's why I say I'm not going to upset that apple cart and tell you to go change things. Uh, but if we're paying that much, uh, we can buy uh, several really good people that are qualified in Oracle. I imagine most of the, are these databases all Oracle that we're buying? No. What, what kind of? They're SQL. SQL. Okay. Well, the, the language is about the same. So, uh, I think that we could possibly find some you know great database administrators. Corrections. corrections, do you know anything specifically about that request? Mr. Roger Taylor, the uh, yeah, come on, Mike. director. So a, a lot of these systems, we, we actually have database administrators, um, and they, they are involved in these systems. The money that we're paying oftentimes is for the, the maintenance we get from them. We host databases locally, and our database administrators actually do uh, do some management of the databases on this end. What their what their support is typically for the software database changes that they require to keep their code in line. You know, they don't they're not going to let us get like customized or some, something like that. And so, um, I'm, I mean, we can look at it. I'm not sure adding additional database administrators necessarily mitigates that that cost. That's the, the a lot of these software companies. That's where they get their money for the, you know some of its licensing, some of its software support, some of its management on on their end. But it doesn't necessarily preclude the need for a database administrator on site. We do we do have those services locally. So we probably get an invoice. Can we see what the two hundred thousand dollars is paying for? I mean, that might give us an indication sure. as to what we're paying for. Right. Yeah, and it's the same case with Almentum, onboarding and recruiting. Those are onboarding and recruiting specifically for the cloud service. So they they maintain support. I mean, it's in the cloud. We don't. It's not an on-prem solution anymore. So that's really what you're paying for. Almentum, it's their software. It's off the shelf. We can't go in and make code changes. It, it's their software, so we pay them to maintain it. We implement it because it's on-prem, if that makes sense. But that, that's really what we're paying for is the licensing and maintenance and support of all these systems. So have we looked into what like Johnson County does or other, other counties of similar size and how they treat their technology? It would be kind of interesting to know, you know, what they're doing and if they're seeing any efficiencies in, in saving taxpayer dollars for all of these systems that they're using. I mean, they're probably doing the same things that we're doing. Yeah, I mean, sure. has anybody looked into that? Well, uh, specifically to what point? I mean... Yeah. Well, what are we they paying for their technology and what are we paying for our technology okay. and how can we can't... I yeah. mean, if there's... If people are out there doing it better, I mean, why are we sitting here saying that, you know, maybe we're doing it the only way it's to be done? I mean, maybe we should start looking for other alternatives. I mean, because really, you make a great point if, and I don't know anything about technology. I mean, I know how to use my phone, but, so I, I do trust what you guys are doing, but I just wonder, sure, we when have we looked at other communities and other counties to see what they're doing in comparison to what we're doing? Well, I know specifically with the, the ERP project, we, we looked at several counties up in the Kansas City area of what they were using. We looked at the city of Wichita, and it's a mixture of on-prem, cloud, um, but either way, you're, you, you, you're either paying a, someone to manage it in the cloud for you so that you don't have to have staff to upgrade and just keep the lights on, so to speak, mm -hmm. or you manage it on-prem and you, you house all those FTEs to manage, keep the lights on, all the upgrades and the updates and the security and all that. So it's just a trade-off. You're either pushing the money out to the cloud, paying someone out here, or you're paying someone local. But it's a mixture. I know that for a fact. And, and we do look at that every year. We reevaluate, for instance, Exchange and, and Office. We do an evaluation. Is it cheaper to push Microsoft to the cloud and do Office in the cloud, Office 365, Exchange, and all that? Or is it, and so far, that scale hasn't tipped. It's cheaper to keep it on-prem right now because we have the infrastructure in the data center. So we, we do review that each year on specific things, and if it makes sense to go to the cloud, we go to the cloud. Okay. Well, I'm not saying I'm against any of these things, uh, and I right now it's too late for us to make any changes, I think. I, but I'd like us to look at it sure. and see if there's some other way rather than this. Is, I, I don't know how many more maintenance contracts we've got out there, but just what you listed here is over a million dollars. And if we've got a whole bunch more, we're, we're talking about millions we're spending just on software maintenance. Yep. So I, you are the experts. 
I just want you to look at it. We will. We'll, we'll continue to evaluate it. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Howell. Uh, thank you. Just I hate to ask a similar question I already asked, but I need to understand a little bit deeper. Um, the long sheet on line 29, it says Technology Review Board. Is that what was presented just a little bit ago? Yes. Okay. There's a delta of about just under $50,000. Is that just needs to be a correction or what? There's $49,135 difference between what's on the sheet and what's, what was presented. I'm just curious where that 50000 is. Wes, is the sheet in the book correct or is the long sheet? Where are $40,000? <coughs> well, all, all my sheets, the, the Technology Review Board package and everything is, is 2659000 So I'm not sure what is on the Excel sheet. I don't have that. Two million six hundred ten thousand. So it's just it just needs to be cross checked. Check. Okay. Cross check that. And then I also noticed that there's a, a, re a reduction in the out years. I assume that's not real. A reduction. I I would be surprised if it goes down to six hundred fifty thousand last three years on that sheet there. Your TRB does not go out five years yet, does it? Uh, we're working on it. We're, we're close. So I guess my, my point we is, have, I think the point of the legislation is, and I, th I think the value to us as policymakers is this. We know it's going to cost us about $2.5 million a year. Let's just that, throw a number out there. And maybe some years it'll be $2 million, some years, you know, some years it'll be $3 million. But the average might be 2.5. And so right. the legislation allows us to say, we're going to fund 2.5, and we're going to have a small balance going to carry over the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And next year we'll fund another 2.5, and then we'll be able to draw some of the funds from pre previous years will carry over. We need that legislation. So I'd like to know what the, it's too, probably too hard to answer the question right now, but what was, what's the average? I think the average right now is 2.65, you know, 2.6, roughly 2.65 million dollars right now. But I don't believe those out years are correct. My guess is they may be up or down from this year, but we ought to be planning around two and a half million or 2.6 million each year. I think that's, I would assume that's probably it seems very normal well the current, the current five-year technology improvement plan that we've got going and, and it's it's dynamic it's evolving um, we're, we're averaging between four and five million a year out to uh, 20 2023 what was that number we're averaging in 2023 we have a five-year plan from yeah. 2019 to 2023 and we're averaging between four and five million on technology spins okay. So is this kind of a this could be a low year then perhaps well, we see an increase next year probably. well these these this four to five million includes what I already have flat budget authority on plus the two point six that we're asking for for end of life things so it's it's between four and five million typically I think is a fair estimate of what okay. IT currently is spending okay and just my my question I asked earlier about the five point five million and the forty FTE those are decision packages you're presentation this morning since it's already in the long sheet. So let me, let me answer the question myself to see if I'm correct. <laughs> it's already in the long sheet. The, the balances that are shown on the sheet have already taken into account is that essentially what you presented this morning. So it's not a decision package. It's already in the budget, essentially. We're just understanding what's already presented in the long sheet. Not a decision package, necessarily. We could adjust it, but it's already in here. It is currently in the forecast. Um, it's not anywhere in any kind of budget yet and that can easily change depending on what we hear from you guys on your priorities so what i'm saying is we could we could uh, we could agree to, to to tweak it you know not approve something or whatever that would change the number but the five the uh, 2.610 million dollars is already in this budget forecast in the so as long, as long as we just approve this for the most part it's already into account in our all of our numbers here okay I think I understand it. Thank you so much, Chairman. Thank you. Any other questions for Wes? Uh, Commissioner O'Donnell. Yeah. Uh, so, Wes, thank you for um, your patience on answering some of these questions. I think you can uh, tell that we're not experts on this issue. But I think what would help me out is with all these requests, and you've met with us on other sensitive issues is to let us know what is absolutely required for us to be able to function as a county um, be in line with state and federal regulations but also take out wants from needs because I don't know if 
all of these are absolutely critical or people are just desiring to have some of this stuff. So I think that would help me out, and I'm sure the other commissioners that if we said sure. here, we will absolutely fall apart without these fund without these programs being funded, and these others. Let's put that on the wish list. I think that that that's what I'm gonna that that's what I'm gonna request so that I know where to move from there. And then looking at our outline budget year, seeing how we can fulfill some of those other requests. But but do you have anything okay. separated by priorities? Well, uh, other than the order of which you see it in here, but I think what you're asking, and I can and correct me if I'm wrong, but I can provide a summary for each item with impacts if we don't get it, if that's what you're asking. Like, well, that that's even more. Uh, I, I think that's more information than I really need. Okay. I, I think what I need is say we can live with this and we can't live with this. Okay. I can do that. That that as basic as that without the summary just say hey we will absolutely fall apart without this but we would like these other <laughs> items but Wes isn't that what the technology review board already did you got a whole bunch of requests yeah. and you got rid of the wants and, and you're just giving us needs now yeah well with within this 13 needs though I would say one two three four five six seven one through seven are absolute must okay or we See, risk increasing right. our liability for a data, data breach see I mean that that's what I you know needed okay. to know like literally we will right. fall apart if we don't get certain ones funded now that's not to say that if these other things aren't funded like onboarding and recruiting there's other issues that get impacted like contracts that are already in place it's, it's already gone live you know what I mean that sort of mm -hmm. thing but worst case scenario we, we really need items one through seven or we increase the liability. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Meitzner. Um, thanks, Weston. That, that actually answered my first question. And thank you, Michael, for asking that. Prioritization is critical, I think, yeah. for our decision. But on your, uh, yeah, that slide. So let's say one, two, three, four, number five and six, for instance. So those are recurring every year yes so if we tried to bite half of the apple this year and go into next year I see the let's call it seven eight nine whatever basically the human capital those two numbers are reoccurring 345 and 160,000 are those are people or something or are those licenses which item those people oh well, let's just say the success factors the two success factors that's licensing and support and maintenance. Okay. So if we pushed half of this out to next year, and we're still looking at a reoccurring, once we bite that apple, it's it's in. Yeah. So the rec those life expectancies, when you're, if you're gonna do this, I don't know if, we, if we're asking you to do this, what would happen if, if we don't do that? Can you, or, or like any of these, are these like 10 year licenses? Or are these, do you feel comfortable in today's IT world? Well, that these go on forever. <laughs> no, it's a reoccurring year to year. I mean, it's a, it's a reoccurring fee, uh, specifically on uh, the HR success factors, if that's what we're talking about. Um, document management maintenance, that's an ongoing fee that we pay every year that includes licensing, but it comes due every year. As, as well as so the new factor. CAD system that we're committed to <laughs> is not in, not in here, right? That was reviewed, if I recall from from when I was across the street. You also were looking at what Commissioner Cruz was talking about. What's going on in Johnson County? How does it work with other police departments? Blah blah blah. I feel comforted that you did a lot of uh, background and analysis before you made that decision because there was what was there seven or eight people companies trying to get that contract right there were and they did a request for information basically to try and get all those fundamentals and specifics outlined but that way predated the technology review board right but that system once we've bought it and installing it i think we we're saying this year all right yeah that, that's line 37 on the long sheet there's three million Forecasting for 20 to finish off the cat. What line is it again? Line, Sorry. Um, 37. 37. Okay. 
and we feel that we won't have a an ongoing cost on that I think we think we do but the good part about that is we, we believe most of that can be paid for out of 911 tax funds and so that would not be an impact to your financial <coughs> forecast which you see on that long sheet because that's only looking at property tax supported funds and until we get a vendor picked I don't know that we have a right. number on that yet but yeah okay. every time you buy product software there's going to be maintenance on it. And that's the upgrades and maintenance. If it breaks, if it fails, they come in. So right. we can expect that. And Chairman, to your earlier question, we paid four point five million in software hardware maintenance in twenty eighteen. A lot of money. Just for maintenance. Okay. I have one more question. Um so you say that um on this technology review, review board sheet, one through seven are absolute musts. And so I look at eight and I look at the CTDO electronic medical record replacement. So as bef before this technology review board was put into place, I mean, we know that we have a database. We know that it's going to need upgraded. So you're telling me that before this was in place or the legislation that we need to pass will allow us to put money in a pot for technology whereas before we didn't even though we have like how how did we handle number eight in the past that that request would have come through Comcare's decision package requests when they did their presentation. so is that I'm looking at Tim but it's my understanding CDDO this component because every time I see medical record anything we, if you think of all the medical records we have to track in the county CDDO Comcare the sheriff corrections so we've talked about this and it's my understanding that they have been attaching themselves to Comcare medical records in the past almost 15 years ago we implemented an electronic medical record in both Comcare and the CDDO they happen to use the same product how many years about 15 okay and so we've gotten our money's worth out of that product okay. but it is going into life in April 2020 and so we've gone through the process they're going to use different tools because their needs have changed pretty much so they've changed significantly over the last 15 years so comcare has gone through a process where they did an rfi and they've done an rfp and it turned out that they're going to upgrade the the product that they they purchased 15 years ago they're going to upgrade to a newer version there and there's a significant cost to that but that's built into their ongoing operational budget the CDDO needs a different product, so they've gone through an RFI process and they're going through an RFP process now. They will identify another product that will work well for the needs of their customers and their um, the contracted community partners as well. <coughs> In the past, we've tried to tried to budget for that um, within a two or three window of time when that product is going to go end of life, and that's about where we're at now. But now we've got the TRB process, so it shows up on this master list of other products. I think if we get legislation that allows us to create a fund, and I'm a little bit out of my depth here, so Lindsay's going to correct me as I go, but it would be similar to the fleet fund, where we're able to put money into the fleet fund and then use that money to buy, instead of fleet, we'll buy technology with that fund. And so that's, I think, where we're hopefully headed with the, tech, with the legislation. So I guess... I think what Lacey's asking is so if we didn't have the technology or I'm going to ask this if we didn't have the technology review board and this presentation all of these things that we've talked about would be part of in the past part of the department's decision package yes, correct so yeah. and then they'd all be doing whatever they want to do and not on the same right. page as the technology review board right I guess I'm just concerned when we say you know to Commissioner O'Donnell's question you know what if we say no to uh, 8 through 13 what happens to CDDO with their yeah. records and that's the struggle it, from from an IT perspective that's why I wanted to make sure I prefaced it in the beginning my I feel like my responsibility is the integrity of the overall network and so from my perspective that's what I'm looking at of the equipment and technology I need to protect everybody now that's not to say that the CDDO folks that, that they have a pretty high priority from their perspective. You see what I'm saying? It's all about perspective, and I feel, I just feel like it's my rec my job to recommend the overall integrity of the overall mm -hmm. landscape. 
that's what IT needs. So if this replacement for this CDO, um, if it's going end of life, what do you do? You, l you just limp along until you get one with well, the old program? Is that right? That, yeah, that's where we'd be at. We'd be operating in 2020 for four months with maintenance and support and after that we just have to hope that it stays together and if it doesn't we would have to Dear find God help us exactly that's We'd what we to, do well yeah. and, or you okay. go and you find we, a vendor to come in a high touch or somebody comes in and they fix it for you and you pay yeah. okay and then it becomes yeah. a cost effective question and i think when wes answered the question about the essential stuff from an it perspective it's it's maybe stops at number seven but from a cddo operational perspective Number that's eight number is absolutely one. critical. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say, Tim. Thank you. <laughs> he said it better. Huh. So where does, say it breaks, where does that money come from to fix it? That we'll find it in the department budget. I mean, I, I use the corrections analogy where they had a system that was crashing and they just kept patching and they just kept <coughs> patching and you hire somebody to come in and fix it. And, it, and not only do you get the systems issue to where your staff suffers or you're not keeping your data up to speed, then you're hiring an external vendor to come in and patch and fix it and paying more than you would have paid for a maintenance contract for that same product. So it, it's a question of, it's like running your car. How long do you want to run it? And you want to keep patching it and it ends up costing you more than if you just go buy a maintenance program mm -hmm. for it. So. Mm -hmm. And for example, with that product that the CDO, use, CDO uses now, they pay in their operating budget right now, they're paying a, a licensing fee every year. Now they're only going to pay four months worth in 2020 because it will expire it at that point. So okay. they've got a little bit of money in their budget that would apply to future maintenance costs okay. once we get past the purchase. Tim and I keep missing this one in the middle. She wants me to mention this is also why we have contingency budget allocations out there for you all to know about to where if we have crisis or we have emergency, there are funds to go grab. Did I say that correctly? You want the microphone, ma'am? Okay. <coughs> Very good. Well, Wes, I appreciate the update. Uh, I do appreciate that we're putting everything under IT so that we can get uh, visibility on exactly what we're doing uh, for uh, spending on, I, on technology because I don't know that we had this visibility in the past that uh, we'd be looking at things like this. So, thank you. It makes it for an easier discussion. I have just three real quick points to make, not to muddle this any further, but um, one thing that we're going through, and, I, and Commissioner Howell's uh, uh, question kind of spurred me, Wes has a core budget in IT that he uses for base maintenance for this entire organization. There's monies being spent there. TRB, we've even had this discussion amongst the TRB. TRB looks at replacement organizationally, separate and distinct from Wes's base budget. What we need to do a better job of doing for you guys is combining and merging those so you understand total budget, which I think we can do a better job at. That's number one. Uh, number two, Chairman, to your question, uh, I know, and to Commissioner Cruz's question, Wichita goes to this exact same dynamic. Uh, they have a review board that, uh, that meets. They are buying products off of a shelf. They're, and Wes can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but we used to try to program and create our own, our own programs. We had, uh, and that's a dangerous game to play because if you have failure, you own it. There's no third party you can go back on and if a key employee leaves the organization it just cripples you. We went through that on, on the Wichita side many times. Our very first records management in Wichita police was a lieutenant that crafted it, built it and then left and we were almost at crisis when we couldn't fix it any longer and you learn you just buy off the shelf. So, But I think it's worth the amount of money we're talking about. You're absolutely correct. We should continue to study that. And then finally Somewhere back in the late 90s, early 2000s, we actually had discussion with Wichita Sedgwick County to m combine and do IT projects together. And then we even included 259, too. If you look at the three biggest government uh, employers in this region, and we talked about, had some discussion about some type of merger, consolidation, unification of IT services, because it's such a big money issue. And if you look at just what we're spending, Wichita's doing the same thing, school's doing the same thing. It might be worth a very 
high level discussion again between governments on how to maybe tackle this thing more efficiently because I guarantee you both of those entities are going through the very same discussion during their budget cycle that we are. So well, I hope they're going through it, but I don't know. Until we ask for this kind of information, I don't know we had visibility on yeah, it. We weren't on. ready. I think that I think this positions the county now to have that kind of discussion more efficiently with other, with our, our counterparts across the street. But yeah, I think I, I agree. I, I think Wes has got us heading in the right direction, and finance has us heading in the right direction to manage this more efficiently. It's just choppy this year because it's our first go at this. So very good. All right, Wes, thank you. Thank you. All right, Lauren, what you got for us? We have the Division of Administrative Services. We'll be starting with facilities. It's on page 148 of your binders. And we'll turn it over to Tanya. I got it, Lauren. All right, morning, Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, this morning we'll be covering uh, the Division of Administrative Services. So we will be covering the Departments of Facilities Maintenance and Project Services, Courthouse Police, Fleet, and Central Services. Uh, for Facilities Services, their mission is to provide accessible, safe, efficient, and highly productive buildings and structures where citizens and employees are able to conduct their business and access needed services. Uh, that department is led by Valerie Casters, uh, who is the interim director of facil facilities currently and also the project services uh, manager. Also, we have Andrew Diltz, who is the facility manager. Facilities maintenance uh, and uh, services include preventive service and reactive repair for most county buildings. Uh, facilities maintenance track the percentage of useful life remaining of HVAC and arrest for each building. Um, each maintenance service worker will be responsible for an average of 67,000 square feet of property. Project services administrates and implements CIP projects, administers and manages lease properties, and provides oversight and coordination and facilitation of department remodels and relocation. For 2019, project services will have an average of four CIP projects per project manager with a total of uh, value of four million managed per project manager. And that those services are covered in property, property tax funds. For 2020, the request uh, under general fund is for $7,424,391. And that next slide shows the breakdown per category of personnel, contractuals, and commodities. And that is a percentage change decrease of 4.37%. What page are we on in the uh, budget book, please? 148. Okay, thank you. Uh, facility services does have one decision package. Uh, this is something that you're accustomed to seeing every year. And that is for electricity, water, and sewer rate increase. Um, next year, we're expected to see a 2% increase in electricity, a 5% increase in gas, and a 4% increase in water and sewer. Uh, the way that we come up with that 64,000 is we take an average over the last three years of utilities uh, to come up with that $64,420 uh, that we're putting in the decision package. And again, this is something that I think we have uh, put in at least for the last two or three years uh, increase in utilities. Any questions on that decision package? I'll move on to courthouse police. Courthouse Police mission is to provide law enforcement, uh, first response, safety, and security services for courthouse campus, the juvenile courthouse campus, as well as other county facilities. That is led by Courthouse Police Chief Daryl Haynes, the protection of employees, district court, and citizens <coughs> who the courthouse uh, is the purpose, excuse me, um, the protection of employees, district court, and citizens who the courthouses is the purpose of 
courthouse police, and that's delivered by uh, internal staff of 27 um, FTEs. Uh, the services are um, those services are in property tax funds, and those services include verifying persons uh, admitted who are employees, as well as uh, properly screening um, citizens who come, and also uh, they uh, make sure that uh, there are no dangerous weapons and items that enter the courthouse, as well as the juvenile courthouse. They also maintain 24-hour presence on the courthouse campus and the control center. They patrol uh, and monitor entry alarms, fire alarms, and system alarms and camera systems. Uh, they provide a uniform presence patrolling the courthouse and juvenile courthouse campus to prevent crime and disorder, as well as establish a presence for the domestic uh, protection from stalking and protection from abuse dockets of the district court, as well as other dockets as needed. Uh, Courthouse Police does administer and supply subject matter uh, standardization expertise to the county divisions on camera systems as well as entry control systems and identification systems. On average, uh, it takes a visitor to the Sedgwick County <coughs> Courthouse less than two minutes to enter the <coughs> screening magnetometer. The 2020 request uh, for the Courthouse Police is $1,398,456, and that is a decrease uh, this year of 6.44%. And you can see the breakdown there in each category by personnel as well as commodities and contractuals. Questions on Courthouse, please? I have one question. Uh, kind of goes back to the same kind of question I asked about IT earlier a year ago. Uh, we had a request from Comcare for more security, and now why isn't that under the police budget? How, how do we know what we're paying for security? It goes the same, basic same question as, as I had for IT is for security. Do you want me to answer that, Lindsay? Or well, typically, courthouse police, um, our services cover the courthouse campus as well as the juvenile campus. Anything outside of those campuses are typically done by a, a third-party vendor service. But again, we're spending money for security, and we're not quite sure what we're all we're spending for security or where we have it. Why, why wouldn't we centralize security? Um, for this one, it comes back primarily to the funding source. So I think um, it typically tends to be the grants that support those services, and that's because that's something that's maybe uh, the service is <coughs> mandated by the state or something like that. And so in that case, it wouldn't necessarily be proper for the county general fund to prop those services up. Now, to your point about we don't know how much we spend, we actually do have a specific commitment item. Um, or, or a way that we post expenses that says what security is. And so uh, here in just a moment, I'll go through my uh, documents and I can actually give you that total number. And so we can tell you what it is outside of courthouse police because they're primarily personnel, but we have a contract line for security services. So we can get you that information and the reason it's not centralized at this point, it could be policy decision for you all, but it's because of that financial management piece. Okay, but if we've got somebody that's an expert on security, uh, they ought to be the ones that are tell us what we need for security in all of our buildings, rather than having somebody say, I'm an expert on security in Comcare, I doubt if they are. Uh, we, we coordinate with Daryl. Daryl does a tremendous job coming to all of the lease sites that we have to give us advice on what type of security and camera systems and all of that. He's a great asset in that regard. Okay, very good. Any other questions up to this point? Tanya, thank you. Okay, sure. All. all right, I'll move on to Fleet, uh, fleet Services. Uh, their mission is to provide proper vehicles and equipment, uh, effective fuel services and high quality, timely maintenance and repairs to meet operational needs of supported Sedgwick County Government and Division Departments. Uh, this is led by Director of Fleet Management, uh, Penny Poland. <coughs> fleet provides the right vehicles, equipment, uh, together with timely maintenance and repairs, and that is done uh, mostly by uh, fleet staff of 14 FTEs. 
Uh, their services are provided in non-tax funds, and that's a fleet administration. This program provides the administration and planning for fleet operations with fleet availability of 95%. Uh, they have a heavy equipment shop, uh, with Public Works being the largest customer there, uh, which maintains vehicles and equipment with a gross vehicle weight of one ton or greater. Uh, they provide preventive maintenance and unscheduled maintenance to reduce vehicle downtime. Fuel, uh, this program provides fuel and car wash services to all Sedgwick County vehicles and equipment from multiple fueling stations at the main yard and various Public Works yards. Uh, fuel tanks and pumps are monitored on a daily basis. They also have body shop services. However, this is provided uh, by a vendor uh, outside of the fleet uh, department, and they take care of body damage repair for vehicles and equipment when necessary. Light equipment shop, this provides efficient and effective repairs to all vehicles under one ton with an emphasis on preventive maintenance and safety inspections. Their biggest customers are the sheriff and EMS. They also set up new vehicles uh, in the shop. Vehicle acquisition, this program provides replacement of existing vehicles and equipment that meet the 15 point replacement. 15 point replacement being uh, comprised of usage, age, and maintenance dollars. Fleet air, airplane, uh, this program supports the sheriff's air, airplane, including fuel invoices, monthly maintenance, and unscheduled repairs. Uh, they also have the fleet, or excuse me, vehicle acquisition contingency. This program provides a source of funding for emergency equipment acquisitions and large unforeseeable fluctu fluctu fluctuations in the cost of fuel. Uh, their 2020 request is for $10,036,419. <coughs> and that's a small uh, decrease of 0.37%. And there you can see the breakdown in personnel, contractuals, commodity, and a uh, large uh, line item there for equipment. Questions on fleet? Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I see a pretty big jump in the 2017 to 2019 and continuing to 2020. I'm also curious I mean, if, there's, if there's an explanation to that, but I also wonder about the fire district, if that if equipment for fire district is embedded in this, it's not. If it's, they have its own budget line somewhere else. Why is such? Why is it so variable between? 18 is about one and a half million, and this year is about three and a half million. It's a pretty big jump. It is, and it will depend on the um, purchases being made in a given year. Uh, we've come to you a couple times to do year end equipment transfer. Uh, requests because we won't get equipment in a timely fashion and so then ex that expense occurs outside of the fleet budget but mostly if you go to page 188 it shows that we have a 1.5 million dollar vehicle acquisition contingency um, and the purpose for that is that fleet like the general fund like some of those other funds is what we call a certified <coughs> fund and so if we were going to have some kind of issue like I think we had a dump truck issue a long long time ago where we had to come up with money to buy one um, we would actually have to come to you and go through that whole budget readoption process with a public hearing, public notice, and all that. So we stick some uh, a pretty sizable amount of budget authority in there to accommodate such an issue. So does that 3.5 include the 1. Point, as it does include the 1.5. Right. So if you look at that, um, the uh, capital equipment line, that's actually where you'll see that 1.5 million dollars worth of budget authority in 19 and 20. In, yep. in all of those columns because that's just the budget authority those prior years are actuals and we didn't have any reason to access that contingency in those years thankfully okay. yeah, it makes sense thank you very much thank you any questions on fleet all right central services okay moving on to central services uh, their mission is to partner with county departments and divisions to provide quality customer service and resources that are efficient and cost effective. Uh, that's led by Anna Meyerhoff, uh, Central Services Manager, and those programs include print shop, mailroom, call center, and records management. Their 2020 request includes funding for services in property tax <coughs> funds. And so for print shop, uh, they use a mix of in-house printing as well as outsourcing to leverage the most cost effective and efficient production of uh, print jobs. <coughs> Uh, in 2018, there was 4.8 million impressions printed, as well as an average turnaround time of less than 1.5 days. 
For the mailroom, uh, they process and provide postage for all outgoing mail pieces for the county as well as district court. They assist with planning and creation of large mailings uh, to ensure the county is achieving the lowest postage rate available for each job. Um, in 2018, they uh, had an outgoing mail of 1.2 million pieces. They have a combined call center uh, that reduces time for county personnel spent on routine questions and it also improves customer service through a single contact point. Uh, they have a tax call center that takes calls on behalf of the treasurer's office, tag office and appraiser's office. In 2018, they answered 163,000 calls. They also have a public service call center that takes calls for ComCare as well as uh, most recently for the Department of Health. In 2018, they answered 122,000 calls. Records management oversees the management of records in accordance with the county records management policy as well as the Kansas Government Records Prevention Act. They also lead the county's compliance with the Kansas Open Records Act. Uh, this service is utilized by all Sedgwick County except for the Register of Deeds, District Attorney, and District Court. Uh, 2, 000, over 2,000 records were disposed of in 2018, and in, uh, as of March 2019, over 22,000 records were uh, stored in county facilities as well as commercial storage. For 2020, their request is $2,561,171. $171, which is a uh, decrease of 2.52%. And there you can see the breakdown in personnel, contractuals, and commodities. There are three decision packages uh, this year for, or excuse me, for next year in 2020 uh, for central services. The first one being the presidential election postage. Uh, Decision one then uh, package is for midterm and presidential elections create an increase in mail pieces processed by the mailroom. So they're asking for an additional 125,000 uh, for postage. Uh, postage has increased and so um, Anna has confirmed with the election commissioner on this to allow for the additional postage in the presidential election to uh, help with uh, posters that will go out for polling location changes as well as advanced voting and voting ballots that will go out. So um, we are asking for 125000 uh, to accommodate for this additional postage. Commissioner O'Donnell has a question. <coughs> Thank you. Well, we, we can finish the decision. Okay. I'd be okay. glad to move on to. Put, okay. I'll move on to decision two then. Decision package two then is for an e increased cost of paper. Um, this is something that we are seeing nationwide um, as far as um, increase in paper cost, um, which is due to supply and demand. Um, the print shop, um, basically, they they cover the cost of paper for all of the county and district court, and so. Um, Again, what we're seeing is landmark increases in the cost of paper. And so without additional funding, what will happen is departments will have to pay out of their funding for this increased cost of paper. And so the request here is for $50,000 uh, for additional funding to cover the increased cost of paper. Decision package three then is for uh, call center translation services. Um, as I mentioned, um, the call center took on uh, Department of Health calls in 2019. And so um, what they have found uh, with taking on the Department of Health calls is that they, they receive many calls uh, that requires um, a need for translation services. Uh, that was uh, covered by the health department and the health department is no longer able to provide funding for translation services. And so there is a need um, because the number of calls that, that the call center receives that uh, there is a need to have translation services. So the, the request is for $7,000 uh, to be able to have the, the opportunity and availability to have translation services to, to help uh, those um, callers that are calling in um, to, to receive um, assistance for this program. And so the request there is for $7,000.
And so altogether, central services decision packages, there are three. Again, uh, presidential election postage for 125000 the increased cost of paper for 50000 and then $7,000 for call center translation services. So for a total of 182000 And I would be glad to stop there to have a discussion on those packages, or I can move on. Very good. Uh, Commissioner O'Donnell. Yeah, it. yeah, I think now's a good time. Um, thank you, Tanya. Yesterday, Tabitha was here, and we actually talked about the um, mail ballots. Um, I had asked her just yesterday what the cost of that was, and she said $80,000. Um, you said you verified this with her, or yeah. Hannah did, and, and I have no reason to dispute that. Sure. But that, that is a, I mean, 50% disparity here that, that do you know what the issue would be? It's more than just mail ballots. We also mail postcards for polling place changes. Tabitha expects more she, polling place changes. I'm going to stop you there. Okay. She said that that was included. In her $80,000? Did she, she include the... That, the changes were on that. I think everybody heard. Did she include the advanced voting flyer? Yeah, yes. She said she okay. was doing it all in one. Is that not accurate? And that was for... Because I've been hounding this, Lindsay will tell you, for two okay. years. So I'm bird dogging this. So is that, and she said that was for postage or was it printing? It was for the advanced ballot flyer and she was going to advertise on there the fact that there were voting centers. And so, so, so that was so $80,000 for just the flyer? So my question is, are we talking 80000 plus 125? Commissioner, if you wouldn't mind, let me, let us loop back to uh, okay. so, uh, so Tabitha. That, that is my question. Sure. Now, let, are we talking printing is one of this? Want one of these fees and postage? No, it, it should just be postage. Let us loop back to uh, Tabitha and, and just verify uh, okay. on that. Okay, because that is something I, I need to find out about. And then the uh, second thing about the uh, paper price going up, um, do we have a contract with that or is that something that will go out for bid? Or are they raising prices during a contract? What What's the... So it outlines in the decision package, we did have a contract with Timber Creek. They terminated the contract in February because of the landmark increases. It extrapolated so much over the contracted prices that they were literally driving themselves out of business to meet those needs. Right. So they executed the clause. We worked with Joe Thomas, who we are very lucky has decades in the paper industry. So we leveraged his help and we ended up now utilizing our current staples contract. That ended up being the best prices for us now. So we are using that contract. We can only hold those prices for six months. Staples also said volatility in the paper industry. They can't do a long-term contract with us. So we'll have to keep uh, looking at what we're going to do every few months and see if we need to then go out for a bid again and leave the Staples contract. Mm -hmm. So it's right now it's just a case by case situation. Right. So is this 50,000 what we're assuming should cover it for the year or it could actually be higher or do you think this was a safe um, request? It could potentially be higher. I feel this is a safe request. We do have a little... This is worst case scenario you're thinking. So it could be less than 50. It could be less than. I don't think it will be. Unfortunately, there's a lot of volatility in the paper industry right, right now. They're increasing prices every three to four months by two to four percent. We don't know when it's going to stop. It also really matters what's going on um, federally and internationally. A good, com a big component of this is tariffs on imported paper. So it really depends on what's happening there as well. Mm -hmm. And and we're still uh, we're seeing declines, correct, with how much paper the county uses year over year. I know we had talked about that in some departments, but we also pay for paper for district court, and they are using more, and they're the biggest user. So we are working with communications, and we're going to start doing a countywide campaign. I've been calling and talking to departments and discussing with them how they're using. Um, we're going to leverage technology, make sure everyone's printer settings are set to double-sided paper. We're going to be as proactive as we can be. And does every county pay for the court's paper and printing? It, it would be my assumption that they would have to based on the statute that says the county's responsible for paying for their day-to-day -day operations. Mm -hmm. All right, but we can you. verify. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Cruz. So I have a couple of questions. Um, since we're on the paper topic, 
can we not, I mean, I see these every day and it's like this one, for example, I'm not trying to call him out, but I mean, we could have had four to, to two sides. That's eight slides that would have reduced this by a lot, you know, that and all of these other ones too. I mean, if you think about it, just making simple changes about how much we are printing, and I'm sure you guys are doing that. And so. that, that's some of the proactive stance that we're going to be taking. Um, the print shop has now, so these I'm assuming are people that printed outside of the print shop. They may have chosen to do their own copy art. They are proactively, if someone is sending them their handouts and they just want single-sided slides, they're calling and saying, hi, may we please print them this way? And so we're gonna try and work on some of that standardization, so. Okay, and then my next um, question is about um, the bilingual person. Are we advertising to hire a bilingual person? Are we just not getting anybody that? I don't have a position <laughs> open. Okay. Um, my intention is as soon as I do have a position free when someone leaves that I will hire someone who's bilingual and then we no longer will need the money and we'll be able to do a reduction. Okay. And then lastly, this goes back to the very first decision package about electricity. Um, is this just, what is this electrical cost including? What's this $64,420 include? It, it, so it includes the, it includes, let me go back to, hold on, let me go back to that. It's the increase on what we're paying for electricity, gas, water, and sewer. Okay, so this so, is just gonna be an extra bit from what we already pay. Correct. So, okay. so we pay about, for, for the, the facilities that we pay utilities on, we pay about two million annually. So okay. it's, it's the increase that we will pay on electricity, on gas, and then water and sewer. That, those percentages that I, that I talked about, the 2%, the 4%, and the 5%, okay. that's that little bit on, on those utilities. So I just wanna bring up the, the Mays Solar Project at Mays High. Um, and I understand there is cost to get solar panels, there is cost for maintenance of solar panels, I'm sure. Um, but I would like to start a discussion about what, what they say here on their website, they raised $385,000. <coughs> the approximate savings per month to the school is $3,000. So for each 240 kilowatt system, they'll save approximately $36,000 a year. Um, for each 150 kilowatt system, they'll save $23,000 a year. So as a county and looking at <coughs> renewable resources, looking at what we can do, I think we should at least start the discussion. If dollars equal services and we have a lot of dollars that we're spending, our taxpayer dollars, why aren't we trying to reserve our resources? I mean, not only will we reduce emissions, but we will pay for itself over time. So I think it's worth a study. I think it's worth um, doing some sort of research around what it would cost to put them up and then how much money we would save. I mean, if we're paying $2 million for all of our services, we have a roof that we could put solar panels on. So I'm not even talking about you know, the 600 acres of land, I'm talking about what could we do now um, over the next five years or so that we could start to put this into our budget and save money. Because if we could save $64,000 a year or way more than that, what could we then put those mo that money into other services? So let's start that discussion. I'd be glad to have that, um, that discussion. That's all I have. Okay. All right. Commissioner Meitzner. Hey, uh, Lacey, you, and you covered the uh, transition, uh, translation deal. Thank you. But I was going to ask, a, it, it, I was going to ask a question. Is our 911, does, uh, do they have bilingual operators under our 911 service? Well, she, you know. I'm sure we probably do. I, I know there's, think. I know she is in the market. They, she's actually done something on social media recruiting. Yeah. Okay. Cur currently, Alora does not have any bilingual uh, dispatchers or call takers. She is actively working uh, with resources in the Hispanic community to uh, reach out and recruit. And uh, there was a story actually on Channel 3 KSN last night or uh, <laughs> um, 
that highlights some of the work that she's doing to try to accomplish that. Currently, they have a service that provides that, uh, that language um, translation uh, interpretation for callers who call in uh, in Spanish language. But she's trying to trying to recruit and get uh, a more diverse staff uh, in that call center to serve the community that we uh, the diverse community that we have. So, actually, we're trying to do that across several of the public safety departments um, and corrections and fire and uh, emergency communications. And I know the sheriff is is on board with that as well. So, is there is there a uh, a legal or an HR reason that we can pay a, a bonus or for bilingual it's more of a policy issue than uh, either I mean it is legal I guess on another step whatever I know that in whatever the step there are, there are entities that have policy in place that uh, allow for some type of stipend or some type of uh, you know extra pay for a little bit of an incentive yeah. and you know your policy can vary from uh, requiring them to take a test to verify that they are sort of you know certified basically or, or or something more informal but I know MABCD also has some employees who are bilingual who provide that service basically for the pay that they receive I mean they they provide a very valuable service uh, yeah. to MABCD for the for the clientele that come in and out of there so okay thanks yeah. uh, Commissioner Hal thank you chairman just want to I guess I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I just wanted to, I guess, say it's a it's a desire of mine that we would, we would also minimize the uh, color copies that are perhaps if, if black and white works, we ought to try to use black and white if possible. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a huge difference. I, I've I've, been, I've investigated this before, and it wasn't what I thought it was. It was much more economical and affordable than I thought. When I, when I did the investigation, but nevertheless, if we if we can minimize color copies, just as a policy, I just wanted to re, re I guess say that one more time. She's she's talked about printing on both sides of the paper. For example, it's a good idea trying to minimize our printing costs. That would be one thing we could do as well. That's all I want to say. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I just, uh, Commissioner O'Donnell. Yeah, I just kind of wanted to follow up on what Lacey said. I would think that doing a study on solar panels and other energy savings would be a great idea. Um, I think it could be transformational, and uh, if anybody can do it, I think uh, local government could, and it would pay for itself. And I'm sure uh, David Spears and his team could get that done for us if we gave you the money to do it. So We can do it. Yeah, with enough time and enough money, we can do anything. I, I knew it. I, you, <laughs> this is why we love you, David. You, you are good. So thank you. Oh, good. Well, and it's, we have 600 solar panels, so all the numbers stay level for him. Sounds great. 600. Well, we've got to remove an encumbrance on that 640 acres we got sitting out there because we can't do anything with it right now except grow weeds. We'll have the discussion, separate discussion. We'll have at a workshop in the future on what we're going to do with parkland. But, but we could fit a couple on the roof here. Yeah. But, For sure. But it'd be nice if we could get rid of the encumbrance. And I'd like to challenge my fellow commissioners. I, at uh, each board meeting, we get a book about this thick uh, uh, where we're killing trees. Uh, I use a laptop and I have whatever the cover sheet is. Yep. So it's uh, up to you if you want to keep getting a big book, book each time. Ooh, challenges. <laughs> challenges. Today. What's today, <laughs> Tuesday? Gosh. <laughs> okay, Tanya, I don't see the other. <coughs> All uh, right. We challenge the other commissioners. Okay. Thank you, commissioners. All right. What you got next, Lauren? I just want to note that I have the number for security services for 2018 for all funds. It was $484,210. Okay. Are you going to send all these different things to us on an email? Yes, you can send that to you. All right. What do we have next? Next we have the capital improvement plan. Oh, well, it's time for a break then. <laughs> <laughs>
think Commissioner Meitzner's Go. coming around. All right, Lauren, you're in charge. Okay. <laughs> we have the capital improvement program presentation. Um, you have the handouts from Lindsay at your seats. It's not actually in the book. So we'll just turn it over. <laughs> All right. Good morning, commissioners. Um, so this is not going to be brief, and I apologize in advance, but we'll try and cover it in a relatively enthusiastic manner. Um, so just as a reminder, what you see on your long sheet and what Lorian briefed to you in her financial forecast was what based on what was in the adopted budget last year. So everything you see today is brand new, fresh information. Some parts carried forward from last year's CIP, some parts didn't. So you will have two, actually three handouts at your seats. You'll have um, a two slide per page, double-sided uh, PowerPoint presentation. I think we can get four though. Okay, well, I don't know, my <laughs> eyes are, <laughs> I don't think my eyes can handle that. <laughs> Uh, then you'll have a very small sheet where we're going to test your eyesight abilities for sure that looks like this. And then you will have something from Public Works as well that looks like this. And so that will be all of the projects. So the way this presentation today is going to be structured, um, I'm just going to walk you through real quick kind of a roadmap. We're going to talk about what the CIP process is, what this thing, what the plan <coughs> even is. We're going to get into the details on the facilities and drainage piece of the CIP. Um, then David will come up and walk you through the road and bridge portion of the CIP. Um, I think he's going to talk with you about a couple of other projects that have come up kind of outside of our normal process that we need some direction from you all on. Uh, then I'll come back up and we'll talk about the funding plan for all of this and then we'll have questions and discussion. So we are set to break at noon um, for lunch and resume at one o'clock. Uh, so we're going to try and get through as much of this as we possibly can. Um, but I will, I guess, leave it to your direction, Chairman, if there's a good stopping point or something. If folks want to go to lunch earlier, let us know and we'll be flexible. So uh, with that, we'll jump into the presentation. So we're going to go through, again, a quick overview of what the CIP is and get into all the different types of projects in the funding plan. The purpose of the CIP is to identify capital needs for various county functions and departments and divisions. And we present those in one comprehensive document and plan for you all. It is five years worth of uh, information. We only really truly care about the next year's budget plan uh, for your annual budget adoption purposes. That's all we really can affect. Um, but of course, because these are such big expenditures, we want to have at least some kind of guidance from you as to what the next five years ought to look like. Um, within this plan, uh, we prioritize all of the capital needs within the government into this single plan. We fit those prioritized projects into the budget and try and do it in a way that minimizes disruption from one year to the next. And then, of course, this is a very helpful way to turn around and communicate this information to citizens. So the CIP committee is made up of seven scoring members listed here. Many of those folks are here in this room. Uh, we also have Scott Knabel from City Planning uh, to kind of give us a, an outside look, um, also to help us with comprehensive plan mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Uh, we do have uh, staff who, though they may not technically have a vote, um, truly are the backbone for what we do um, in our invaluable pieces, and those folks are listed here and also are in this room. So the way the process works is each year there's essentially a call for projects uh, that Valerie will send out in her role as project services manager. And so uh, department heads, division heads have an opportunity to see those and prioritize those and submit them. Um, the CIP committee looks at the written requests. We get a really pretty binder talking about paper that looks like this with all of the background and information and then we call in folks to come in and give us background details and actually this year was really fun we went out to the parks to look at some of the different facilities uh, so we could get kind of a better idea for what the true needs are that are being asked once we have reviewed all of those documents and materials um, each committee member is responsible for prioritizing the projects based on these 13 weighted criteria um, and so you can see there's any number of 
um, categories, whether it's a goal for you all um, and attaining a goal that you've set for us, if it's protection of citizens or protection of employees, if it's going to generate revenue, if public demand tells us we want to do it, um, and then of course we'll look at kind of the efficiency, if there are projects that can be lumped together um, or phased in over time uh, that work well with other projects that might be on the plan, we're definitely going to look at trying to do that to achieve synergy there. Um, so these are the different criteria that we use. Then the whole team gets back together um, after everyone has scored uh, their projects and we talk through each of the projects and make sure the overall school score really does represent what we actually thought it ought to. Um, and as a part of that process, we categorize those projects into four classifications and that's how you'll see the information broken out on your sheet that looks like this. Um, this is helpful because it shows it all in a cascading view, but we'll delve into each of these categories in your presentation. So category one um, means that it is a high priority, the highest priority category that we have, and or it is consistent with an existing long-term preventive maintenance schedule. So if you look at your sheet, you may see that row three, that's called replacing parking lots, doesn't have a figure until 2023. Um, that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that it's not important. It just means we don't have anything in that preventive maintenance schedule that requires that work to be done any sooner. Category two, the need is not as urgent. We definitely think it ought to be done, uh, but it's not as urgent as our category one projects. And then category three, they should be funded, but they're definitely not an emergency, especially when we're trying to achieve that budget stability over the five year horizon. And then finally, category four are those projects that are not without uh, merit, uh, but the problem is maybe we don't have enough information yet. Uh, we need to see how other things flow first before we make a decision about how to do that, um, or there's space need studies or other things that are happening. And so those actually get put on a facility or drainage watch list. We do not have a watch list on the road and bridge side, just to make that clear. <coughs> So after everyone goes through, vets it, and we categorize it, then we basically come up with a funding plan and we mesh that with the forecast and the debt policy to make sure that we, whatever we propose will not be outside the realm of possibility for commissioners um, set by your own policy, state law, other things. Uh, we shift projects from cash to debt as we think is necessary to be fiscally prudent. Uh, we return um, all of that back to the CIP committee for final vetting uh, before that comes to you. So what you see now is a tentative version of the recommended budget CIP. What is very important at this stage of the process is for us to get feedback from you. Is this consistent with your expectations, your needs, your goals? And if not, please let us know and we will recast it before it comes back to you in the recommended budget. This is your CIP. And so from here on out, this will be the last formal presentation on this until we get to the recommended CIP. Um, so it's just gonna follow the rest of the steps in the process. So when we walk the halls with you uh, to talk about what you heard here, if there's any high priority issues for you, that would be a great time for you to maybe give us that feedback um, if you're not comfortable having that discussion today or if you have questions you wanna ask. So with that, we will get into the details then. Uh, we're gonna talk about facilities and drainage first, and I am grateful that we have the knowledgeable and experienced folks like Tanya Cole, Valerie Castor, uh, and Andrew Diltz here in the audience who can come up and help answer questions that may be beyond me. <laughs> so this again is category one. Category one again means this is the highest priority need that we identified as a CIP committee out of all of the requests that were submitted for this capital improvement plan cycle. So the first one is flood control systems, major maintenance and repairs. So if you remember when Public Works did their presentation, they talked about how we partner with the city to do flood control. This is one component of that, uh, $500,000 per year. Now, when we get past this five year cycle, we'll start to see these numbers start to tick up. We talked about that a little last year and we can come and walk the halls um, if you'd like us to on what that long-term plan looks like. <laughs> Um, the next couple, uh, actually the next three, are part of a preventive maintenance schedule. The first is replacement of roofs on county-owned buildings, 
And so this assessment was done back in 2010 and um, that had qualified engineers who came in and looked and gave us an analytical and objective basis for repair and replacement of the roofs. Um, maybe here uh, in the next few years, we'll start talking about doing another assessment, but right now these projects go all the way out to 2030 uh, plus. Parking lots, the same kind of situation. We only have one parking lot uh, that after that objective and analytical assessment needs to be replaced in this horizon, so that's in 2023. Lindsay, then, can I ask a yeah, quick, absolutely. Is this is this reviewed every year, and we have a new five years? Yes. Okay. And right. depending on whether a need shifts, so for example, we talked about that roof on adult detention facility. That is one that was escalated a little bit earlier than was originally planned, just because of weather and extenuating circumstances. So yes, this is updated each year. Right. So this five year out and ten year out, it's it's just a. It's, it's, it's guidelines, amazing, but, it's but, but they're out and looking at, our folks are out and looking at that, making recommendations for changes right. as necessary. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so the next one is outdoor warning device replacement, uh, fancy word for sirens. Um, and so we've talked about this over the years, but this is not for the maintenance <clears throat> of those sirens. This is for actual replacement or new installation of sirens to be in, to, to qualify for the capital improvement plan. And so that amount is flat for the five years. Uh, then the adult residential and work release rating room expansion. <clears throat> um, actually, I'm gonna skip ahead to a slide. Uh, if you see the top two photos here, um, these were actually two pictures taken in this area. Um, as you all know, in January 2018, corrections assumed responsibility for work release. And that resulted in an increased population of 100 clients. Um, and the current rating room only seats eight. So this is what that can look like uh, in a given day, those top two slides. What's the address here? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, do you? I can find, I can use my very useful big book and tell you. It's not the one across from the arena. 622 Central. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, next on our list, of course, is the county administration building. This is a carry forward from last year. It's represented in the same year it was represented in last year. Uh, just as a reminder, we did set aside $3 million of cash for this project um, as a year in transfer last year uh, from those proceeds that were reimbursed back to the general fund. This portion only represents uh, the spending that would be in that year from bond proceeds. So overall, this project is actually $24,048,145. Um, but again, because this is based on the funding plan, that funding's already set aside. Uh, that's why it's represented in this fashion. Um, again, we talk about synergy of projects. Well, as soon as this building would be cleared out, there would need to be some significant work done to repurpose it for appropriate space for DA and district court. And so you can see that there's a three-year phased in approach to that. Um, and then finally, at the juvenile residential facility, the HVAC system needs to be replaced. This is something also that carries forward from prior year CIPs, and that would be included in the 2021 budget. Um, so this slide just kind of captures some of the projects that we just talked about. Again, the top two are actual photos of that waiting room. Uh, the bottom is what a potential annex to this building would look like if the courthouse was expanded to include administrative space. And then the siren photo came actually from um, our Twitter account just a couple days ago. And Tom looks like he has something he wants to say. It depends per year, whether it's replacement or uh, adjustment. But I think it's four to six. But if all of the CIP dollars for, for replacements, and then, Rusty, do you know how many we get? I would like to know how many new we get per year. On average, five, depending on whether it's a yeah. We try not to place new sirens unless there's an absolute population change that, that warrants it. So it's generally trying to replace aging sirens that are no longer repairable and functional. So on average about five per year. Five existing that you're replacing. Generally How often do you add new ones? Again, that, that depends on 
like housing developments and well, those kinds of things. Well, they're warning sirens, meaning that they're intended to warn people who are engaged in outdoor activities. Uh -huh. So if we have some type of development in an area that outdoor green space is also developed and it's mm -hmm. attracting a lot of people, that would be a place for consideration for a brand new siren. So it doesn't happen frequently, but it happens on occasion. So kind of case by case. <coughs> Okay. All right. Uh, quick question. I'm curious about the uh, district court and DA expansion. Uh, the district court, I understand, but the DA expansion renovation, are we not doing some of that with what we've already approved? We are. Uh, so that adult detention facility project that you all approved to happen this year actually includes them to come in and redo that space that they are vacating. Um, the idea would be with an administrative building, uh, you know, obviously finance would move out, which is on 8 and 11. Uh, okay. That space would need to be remodeled after folks were moved out. The space here on the third floor, or second floor, county treasurer space on the first floor would all have to be remodeled. And so depending on what phase it's in is where the funding is reflected. So these numbers are still, well, these are still the right, correct numbers then? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Okay. So moving to category two, um, again, you can kind of see based on the fact that they're important, but not as urgent as category one. These tend to be funded um, not in next year's cycle, but in later years of the cycle. Uh, the first is the household hazardous waste facility expansion. Uh, this would be a remodel of the existing facility and expansion to the north of the building. It would be about 6,000 square feet. Uh, this building was constructed back in 2002 and just some interesting facts from 2002 to 2018 on the level of service demand that this building now accommodates. So in 02, the facility had about 400,000 pounds of hazardous waste from 7,000 customers. In 2018, that number was 1.2 million, so three times the amount from 25,000 customers, so three and a half times the number that were served in 02. Um, and that certainly seems to carry across on other things we see like the swap and shop. Now an interesting part of this um, proposal is that right now that solid waste fee is paying for that original work that was done to the facility. Um, based on the timing of this project, we would just essentially be able to continue that flat amount of funding um, to pay for that debt service on that construction. So this would not actually be an impact to the financial forecast overall because there would be revenue coming in to offset this without a uh, resulting increase in the solid waste fee. It could remain flat for this purpose. Now, did I miss it? Is this a, re a renovation? Or it would be an expansion of the existing building. Where do we expand? We got a railroad on one side, got a street on another side, got a street on another side. There's some parking area, and it would expand into that parking area. And I guess if Valerie, if you want to talk to any of the details on that, uh, we're, it's still in the schematic design, but to the north. To the north. Mm -hmm. It'll be tight. So there's room. To expand but then there's no parking for the employees is there um, well again it's still in this schematic design phase um, but what they were proposing was uh, having the parking along the east side was sufficient for their needs there's like a grass space to the north of the building is that where you're talking about there's parking to the north and some grass and that's where the expansion would pretty much take up the entirety of um, and I want to say from the conversations uh, and I need to to discuss with them again um, but they were saying the existing parking that they have on the east side of the facility was sufficient for their needs okay. right. and on on that has there been any discussion about if we are going to spend a substantial amount of money about maybe putting one maybe in the northern part of Sedgwick County that was not discussed. I mean, I appreciate it being in my district, but I think there's a whole lot of people that might be better served if you did it further north. <laughs> Just a suggestion. Commissioner O'Donnell, uh, David Spears, Public Works. Uh, you, no, we're not planning another okay. permanent facility, but as you know, Every year, each yeah. commission district gets a remote facility just for Absolutely. a week, uh, you know, Saturday, and that seems to satisfy a lot of people. Great. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Is that a, is that a new item to this list? Yes, <coughs> and it's brand new this year. This is a thought. It might be nice to know what year these were added to the list. So if if, if it gets pushed okay. out or whatever, if it if it gets inserted in the in the in the priorities, it might be nice to know that it's it's urgent. It was in, it was inserted. It's a new idea or something's been pushed out and it's continuing to get pushed off. No problem. You get to put like a little a year next to it or something. Okay, we Thank can do you. that for future CIPs Thank for you. sure. Okay, um, so moving to the next two, these are items that are carry forwards from last year's CIP discussion as well, although they have moved up a bit in terms of when they're being funded in this tentative CIP. The first is the pavilion at Lake Afton Park, um, and the next is the Cottonwood Shelter at Sedgwick County Park. And the reason these two are slightly escalated above others is uh, these are revenue generating opportunities. Um, and again, we did go out and tour some of these facilities and had a chance to see uh, some of the challenges that they were facing. And certainly as Sedgwick County is something that's rented out to citizens, we wanna put our best foot forward. And so these were some things that we were uh, wanting to escalate in the process. Um, the next two items are actually the same item um, but because we're talking about this from kind of a funding perspective, they're broken out into two lines. This also is a new project for this year. Um, and so this would be a remodel of the emergency communications space. Uh, the, and within the existing facility, we would partially demolish two offices and one conference room's walls that are directly adjacent to the call center. Um, and then that would open up space to allow for this expansion. 26 existing workstations would have the power relocated and then 18 new stations would be added. So that overall there would be um, 44 new workstations put there. So those old ones would go away, 18 would be added for a total of 44 replacements. A portion of that may be funded from the 911 tax fund. Um, we would intend to bond that portion and you'll see that on your detailed sheet and again that's because that 911 tax fund cannot absorb that kind of impact in one year um, and so we, this would be a way for those 911 tax funds um, to be able to be spread out over time um, and pay for that the other portion is not eligible to be paid for from the 911 tax fund and so we would just simply pay that with general fund cash uh, and so all told, um, those numbers together represent just a little over a million dollars. And then finally, uh, the last project within category two is the health division flooring uh, at their 1900 East 9th Street uh, facility, that one just down the road from us for about $200,000. That would be both public space and employee space. And so you can actually see these top two slides here, or I'm sorry, the, the top two pictures on the left are photos um, of what that flooring looks like back in some employee space. So you can see there's some duct tape on the carpet um, and then some squares here where you can kind of see the underlying floor coming through. And so those are some needs where, um, of course, facilities is keeping an eye on whether there are safety issues and we'll address those more immediately. Um, but to the extent it's cosmetic and something that uh, employees see, it's not as high of an urgent need as others we might see. And then... Can I stop you there? Of course. Lindsay, since we're talking about the health department. Um, so next year, is that when we get complete control of the building and the city of Wichita is out? I believe. And we're gonna acquire that from the city for what, a dollar or something? Is that correct? So was that the point that we were going to look at? Are we going to invest in this building and fix it up or find a new location or do whatever? But I don't see that on any of these. Um, because that is something on the horizon that we're going to have to address because the the condition of that bit building is pretty abysmal and I don't know if the the new commissioners have gone or not but I mean mm -hmm. when I went there were you know the ceiling and the floor I mean really and it's asbestos laden so the question that I would have is why are we even talking about carpet in a singular sense when there's so many issues that building has if we're going to invest in it and if we own it in a year we need to probably address more than just carpeting sure so yeah, I, think I thought that there was some discussion about uh, uh, us moving because KU Medical Center wanted to expand and needed that area to expand at 
and I've heard both of those things and, and as a CIP committee we have talked about the idea that those that building is coming on to our books um, we don't yet have any type of idea what that looks like uh, so there's nothing in this proposal for that the flooring is here because it's been on the CIP for a number of years um, and it and as you can see there are some pretty clear needs here but I think depending on the outcome and I guess I can defer to either Tom or Rusty if they want to speak um, to the KU Med piece I'm not as familiar with that uh, that will be when we come up with a plan yeah. but we've deferred the flooring for a number of years because of these other discussions about acquiring the building and what we're going to invest in a building if we're going to move out we don't want to put 200,000 in to tear it down but sure. so I don't know and, okay. and that's probably a, th this is probably a separate discussion and, and I guess that's why I was shocked to see that we even had flooring on there okay. since we don't know what the future of that building is going to be it, it is a 2022 item right now so, and I think we have this discussion over the next year on what what the long-term plan for this building is okay All right. thank you you done with category two yes um, where's the election office at it will be category four category four watch list item <laughs> Thought it would have been higher than that well and we'll talk about why it's there when we get to that portion because there are a few things on there that I think we all know that there's need we just need more detail before we move forward so category three again are those items that are definitely on the horizon um, but there's a lower sense of urgency uh, most of these are carry forwards from prior year uh, CIPs um, the boundless playscape rubber base replacement um, is in for 2022 um, the rest are in later years but you'll see that the first three including the rubber uh, base replacement are all at Sedgwick County Park um, and so that's why there's kind of the weirdness you see with the years there but there's one project per year um, and then moving out to Lake Afton Park there's the replacement of the playground structure uh, space development for that JRBR space um, that actually just came up in discussion with you all during Tim's culture and rec presentation the other day uh, the campsite water hookups uh, which would expand the number of hookups available to folks who go out and camp uh, that's out in 2024 and then finally administrative building carpet replacement at EMS is also in the final year of the CIP this was a new project this year um, so here are some fun pictures of some of those lake hey, items. Lindsay, just yes, a, sir. A, a small note, um, a third category, fitness course, disc golf, blah, blah, blah. Um, the group ought to consider, I don't, I don't know why this popularity of, of uh, pickleball is happening, but pickleball might be a lot more used than disc golf okay. and, and space-wise and everything else. It's Maybe by the time we get to 2020, whatever it is, it, maybe pickleball will be done and gone. But, but it a is a new trend. It is very popular right now. In, okay. Uh, in all the city parks and then even the private development stuff. So just a note. <clears throat> and Tim, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. I think it's a great idea. Okay. I think it's, it's significantly more expensive than disc golf, but we'll be glad to look at it. Commissioner Cruz. So the tires that we collect, what 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 is this boundless play, playscape rubber base made out of? Tires, ground up tires. It's, yeah, it's, it's some type of rubber. I don't know. It's, it's I, I'm sure it's ground up tires. Part of it. So do we the tires that we collect? What do we do with those? And we basically turn them over to a recycling entity that handles you know, those vendor, for us. A vendor picks up all those tires and then they recycle or whatever they do with it uh, and some of it I'm sure for playgrounds some can be used for roofs and, uh, different things so and they take it for free no, no we pay for they that charge so we pay that. them to take our tires and then we pay somebody to put a rubber base on our playground I'd say that's But this isn't ground up on that playground. This is a map. Is there a is there a way to utilize the tires that we collect? I don't know anything about this. I'm just asking a question. So so we we, we would have to all talk to the vendor about that. I'm not sure. Uh, Susan Erlenwein runs that operation. Yeah. And but they 
we pay them to take the tires and I don't know what they do with them. I just you know <coughs> my guess is the things I just described earlier but I guess we could talk to them about that um, but for sure you'd have to get the steel belts out of them. right and maybe yeah. I'm complicating the issue but I just want to ask the question I mean if we are collecting these things is there a way to I will ask Susan about that and see if that could be inserted I'm not sure it can but okay. at the boundless playground it's not ground up tires there it is a mat it's a right. it's, it's a this. poured product it's poured in place it's a it's a it's tires I'm sure rubber tires but there's also a binder so it's a liquid that gets poured in place but we could certainly talk to the person who's taking the tires and see where they sell it's them not, maybe we could get a deal it's not just taking a tire and grinding it up and dumping it out no I, I and I understand that I mean I, I get that I just wonder if there's a way to utilize what we already collect if we're getting a bunch maybe not I'm just asking a question no and just commissioner to your point this is what that rubber base looks like on this first top photo kind of that pinkish so that's what we would be looking to replace Aren't we a fun group? You guys are fun. I was just noticing that. <laughs> Jim has a question. Oh, yeah. sorry. Wait for I, I'm curious. We have, an, we have an agreement with uh, Boundless Playscape, don't we? Is the this, Sunrise Rotary Club. This is our responsibility to replace this rubber mat? The maintenance of that is, yes. Okay. Is this a new item on our list? No. This it's is carry forward from last year's CIP. Okay. You know when the uh, campsite hook water hookups at LAP were added to this list? It was quite a long time ago, wasn't it? Uh, I last year. Last year, okay. And there was a dog park added this year? No, it was added last year as well. It was. Okay. And I realize I do have a an error in my top line. There should be an asterisk next to that to indicate that it was included in the boundless playscape was included in last year. So I apologize for that. My, my last question would be, when I had talked to Mark about like Athen, didn't we put in a few of these last year, right? Uh, uh, a few of the water hookups and electrical hookups and stuff? Not that I'm aware of, but I'll defer to Tim. There are, existing, there are a limited number of existing water hookups and electric hookups out there. So this request is to expand and move to the right. east side of the lake yeah. as well. Because yeah. unlike a lot of these requests, this one actually generates revenue. Right. And I know we increase the, the fees for 2019, correct? So I'd be interested to see what the um, economic, you know, okay. impact would be. That I, I know it probably wouldn't pay for itself, but unlike everything else, this one actually generates revenue. Okay. No, I, I just, um, I guess I don't, I don't, I don't have much awareness exactly what the dog park or the fitness. Of course, I mean, where are they out there? What's the, you actually have a number here, so I guess there's a plan, but I don't, I've never seen that plan, so I really don't know what that is. Okay, well, and what we can do is maybe get the details of the, the proposals that came in and we can get those to you. There are quite a few details in there that we can talk about with you. Okay, just me, I was gonna say, me personally, I'd like to see the, the, the campsite hookups moved up above the dog park, is my opinion. Okay. But there's, is, aren't there other dog parks in the, I mean, how many dog parks do we have in Central County now? I mean, it's, it's, I get, it's getting kind of popular. I think a lot of cities have them now. So I'm just wondering, do we, do we know where they are? Do we really? I, I don't, but we can get that information. It might be nice to know that, you know, how much of a need this would fill. So I don't know. Thank you. That's all I have. Any other questions on priority three? Okay. Oh, yeah. Jones. I would Thank like to that. point out how fun though we are as a CIP committee before we move off of this slide it looks like a great group it was a good time okay thanks for humoring me so category four is our watch list um, again just because they're on the watch list doesn't mean we don't think they're important what it means is we don't have enough information yet to know where they should be slotted maybe the amount so we're going to talk through each of these individually if you will just bear with me so that first one is the Regional Forensic Science Center DNA Lab Edition. And actually, at this very moment, as I understand it, we have um, our on-call architect, 
correct? Uh, going through and doing some space planning exercises. This original request, the, that's the basis for this 4.6 million, um, assumed that it would be a two-story building, um, replace labs, add space for new scientists, those kinds of things. And so before the committee wanted to move forward, uh, we wanted a space study done <coughs> to let us know what was the, the best way to do this. Were there opportunities for existing space to re be repurposed? And so that, that's why this is on the watch list for now. Certainly, we've also had it on the watch list over the years, as the state has talked about, um, for sexual assaults, testing every kit that would expedite something like this, uh, and we would have moved it up in priority um, and done it more quickly. But that action has not taken, been taken yet, um, but that is something that we still keep an eye out. Uh, it's likely, based on whatever the results of that space study are, that this will come into the CIP uh, through next year's deliberations, based on your feedback. Next is the county election building. Um, I think at this point we have heard a lot about there are the true needs that the election commissioner has, uh, but we know that there's warehouse space uh, down at the property, uh, shared with the property and evidence space for the sheriff. We know that she has space in the historical courthouse. We know that there's a master plan going on for the space around uh, this facility or a development of that. And so there's just still a lot of information um, that we don't have, as well as we also don't know what the Department of Homeland Security will actually require for the safekeeping of that equipment. Um, in talking with Tabitha, I think she understands that with a presidential election happening in 2020 anyway, there probably wouldn't be <laughs> likelihood that this project could be done in 2020 um, because there's so many other things going on. So that's why this remains on the watch list until there is more information. Again, not to say that there's not a need, we just need more information. So when's our master plan going to be ready for us? Um, June or July. Between June and July. Between June and July. Okay, uh, so next on the uh, on the list is construction of a new EMS West post. Um, so we think that this was somewhat addressed through this uh, cycle for 2019 where a new crew was added out west. Um, but there's also uh, some look uh, some looks being done at where is the growth happening in the county and where is the best place to put a new post? And is it um, the spots that we've already talked about out west? Is it a different spot out west? Is it south, north, east? Um, and so while that analysis is occurring, these things remain on the watch list. Um, and again, this is something that as more information becomes available, I believe it will Im influence next year's CIP. Um, the next one is the juvenile re residential facility remodel project. So uh, we have an HVAC replacement um, that you already saw back in category one. Um, this would uh, remodel some of the existing space or JRF to make it um, more efficient, uh, to make it more user friendly. Um, but certainly we want to see if there's some options to phase this in. Um, and. Uh, at this point, it's it's less of a priority than some of those other things because the current space works maybe just not as well um, as we would like it to. Next is construction of an EMS garage facility, and this has bounced in and out of the CIP and on and off of the watch list over the years. Um, at this point, again, as we continue to talk about master space plans and um, space uh, growth and fire stations um, and the fire district's future and some of those things uh, this is another item that can we think can remain on the watch list until we kind of see what space shakes out um, we've been operating under this model for some time one of the primary motivating factors in doing this is that our ambulances have to be kept at a certain temperature um, and stored in a certain way in order to protect the equipment and, and everything that's uh, within the ambulance um, but because we've been able to operate it this way for some time uh, the CIP committee didn't quite see the urgency just yet in getting this plugged in uh, but as more information comes available on all those other moving pieces certainly this is something that can move into the CIP where are they at now uh, the the ambulances are scattered throughout the county uh, <coughs> some sit at fleet um, some sit in different bays depending on the different EMS posts and I guess Rusty do you have anything you want to add to where those are stored they would like to have a central facility down there by Dallas. Rusty, Florida. can you come up here? I think they're. Yeah, this has been in the CIP for a while. Um, Scott had pitched this uh, in order to centralize the uh, 
the spare ambulance is in one location down on Stillwell. Um, currently, there's ad adequate space in the posts that we have across the county. There are open bay space uh, and some space down on Stillwell to keep these ambulances. So we're able to manage and maintain in the current with the, with the facilities we currently have, and there are no hardships being created by this. So based on the cost and based on the fact that uh, we really need to do some more analysis on what the space they wanted bays, but then they also wanted some space for storage. And uh, right now, I think we're okay with what we have. So we're comfortable leaving this on the watch list while we continue to assess the true needs re regarding a storage garage, particularly if we're going to add another post at another location in town, maybe in the next year or two or three. So just trying to prioritize needs and, and costs. What are we using in all that space uh, that we were going to tear down up Park City for? When we renovated they, they've area. moved some of the spare equipment up there, some of their specialty equipment and, and spare ambulance equipment up there. So that that base space up there is being used for some of this equipment that they would would want to use this garage for. So like I say, we have we have available space to manage manage these ambulances. Okay. So if we've got all of our ambulances someplace, uh, we really need uh, three quarters of a million dollars on CIP. That's why it's remained in the watch list. Scott put it on there a few years ago, at least a couple. It's been on there, this may be the third or fourth year, um, but it's just kind of carried over from year to year, remaining in the watch list, more or less, because um, the need has not been okay. urgent. Right. So we, we can talk about that. All right, Commissioner Cruz has a question. So you said something really interesting about the storage of them and the temperature. You, I mean, that's kind of cool. Will you explain that to me? Um, that's a regulatory um, requirement from the state. If the ambulance is being kept stocked with medications and, and equipment, they recommend, uh, I don't know the exact temperature. I think it's more of a room temperature type, so that it's not sitting, out, sitting in the extreme hot or the extreme co cold fluctuating a lot. So uh, if it's in, in a facility that's generally, you know, uh, temperature regulated to some extent. and there was no lid though we always have to put if you watch EMS posts go up we'll put heated floors or some degrees. type of heating mechanism yeah. in there because there is a minimum but I've been told there is no maximum so that we don't have to air condition these ambulances but we do have to heat yeah, them. The, the minimum was 50 degrees and just I think Scott's vision on this chairman was to have a centralized location close to CMF or uh, uh, fleet I'm sorry <laughs> went back to my city days over there for a minute but close to, to fleet so that they could be, um, you know, worked on and fixed, and that was his idea for the Stillwell <coughs> garage. Um, and what we've been doing, and what we'll continue to do, is piecemeal. I, I agree. I'm not sure this needs to remain on. We could discuss that in the future. But that was why this made the list to start with. How many spare ambulances do we have? I, I was going to ask that question. Do I think it's around four to six? I mean, yeah, I think we're at the five or six range right now. Of a total fleet of about what 28, 27, 28? I think we're running 24 ambulances at peak times, and then I think we have five or six spares. A fleet of just short than 30, and then, you know that's another discussion between the EMS director and Penny, and what, what should our spare fleet look like? It should always be ready to up and run, because if an ambulance goes down, clearly we have to have a replacement for it. So um, those are the kinds of discussions we have, and in that whole discussion was having a place down on Stillwell, close to fleet, close to maintenance, where we could manage this, so. Okay. Okay, so the next item on the watch list is the emergency management EOC room remodel. Um, so this, uh, likely after we get through the 911 space remodel and after we figure out the long-term plan for staffing needs and everything for 911, um, I think we'll need to have a discussion, or the CIP committee believes we'll need to have discussion on what to do with emergency management, particularly if that public safety building really needs to be di uh, diverted and used exclusively for 911 use. Um, and so instead of spending $250,000 to change that room around now. I think we want to see what the long-term plan is and then come to you with that. Um, and that also, as far as I understand, could be part of that master plan discussion related to what the admin building will be used for um, and how that could look depending on whether the commission chooses to go forward with that. 
Yeah, one quick comment on that too. If you look at our EOC room, you're all, you've all been there. It is an arena style seating. I've been to Johnson County, I think Rusty's been a number of places too. The ideal EOC room is just a, is just a room. It's a multi-purpose room where you can set tables because when you mobilize that group, that is the definition of a leaderless group. And the way we have it structured right now is there clearly is a focal point leader. And that's operationally, that's really not optimal for running an EOC. So Johnson County has a just a big old room where they can set all of the EFS stations up. And um, there's a dialogue and monitors and we can do better. So that was the, the remodel cost or the remodel uh, theory behind that but as Lindsay said we'll wait to see what happens with 911 and the call takers before we move on that so the final item on the watch list uh, is this Northeast Sedgwick County Park um, certainly we've heard lots of discussion from you all uh, particularly in the last week or two about um, the idea of developing or doing something with that land um, and so this is our way of indicating to you it's on our radar and we'll start looking into those things um, and we'll come back to you with a plan after we hear what your priorities and goals are associated with that so again only looking at the facility and drainage component of our capital improvement program this is how those costs break down you can see that over the five years for the facilities we're looking at about 34.6 million dollars uh, for facilities alone the largest portion of that of course 21 million is for the administrative building um, drainage at 2.5 million is associated with that flood control portion that we uh, jointly fund with city of wichita that we talked about earlier so in total the facility and drainage proposal in this tentative cip comes out to about 37.1 million dollars to fund that um, the bulk would come from bond funding and uh, all of this like I talked about before we made sure that this would all jive with your um, debt policy uh, and so it would and that total is about 30.5 million again the greatest portion of that is for the administrative building the remainder of the proposal would come from cash funding or about 6.6 .6 million dollars and so again you can see that total comes out to just about 37.1 million so with that um, if it's okay with you all, we will jump right into roads and bridges. Or, okay, Commissioner, you have a question. I have a I'm question, sorry. Question um, or a, a comment. So, the five hundred thousand for the big ditch that, okay. that's been ongoing and will continue. You're projecting it at, at five hundred. It will be 500,000 at least through the life of this CIP, but based on some feedback we received from the city last year um, and kind of their long-term plan, it's estimated that that amount will go begin to go up. I think it's around 20, 25 or so, up to about 600,000 per year, and then there will be some greater increases um, over the years in order to maintain that levy accreditation. Right. And so we can get you Hopefully the details on what that looks like. At, are they looking at federal funding support? I assume they are. I believe they are, but <clears> I would <throat> want to let maybe Jim Weber speak to those details. Sorry to put you on the spot. It's all right. Or Scott. Um, I think, okay. I think that um, there really aren't federal funds available unless there's a disaster. So all the things we need to do to maintain it are locally funded, but uh, they're always on the lookout for um, for opportunities. But there's nothing that I'm aware of that would we could just tap into for these kind of uh, long-term maintenance things. It's maintenance of the replacement of tow drains. It's the the gate structures through the levee. It's uh, and then some of the stuff gets bigger. That's what she's talking about. It starts to ramp up over time, uh, but the structure itself is over 60 years old, and uh, a lot of it's not been replaced or really upgraded and uh, there are regular inspections by the Corps of Engineers the city does regular inspections uh, and then there's this 10-year cycle of the levy accreditation project which rings you know somebody's got to come in and then uh, a consultant typically would come in and look at the whole thing again and make recommendations so a lot of this I'll call it the flood control CIP is about uh, trying to keep pace with uh, things that need to be uh, fixed before they we get dinged for them and certainly before the 10-year inspection cycle comes up where if we lose our levy accreditation then we lose the ability to have uh, flood insurance in the community so that's uh, that's a kind of a big deal so totally 
So are we involved? Uh, <clears throat> are we involved directly with the city? I mean, are you there to make sure? Hey, okay, this year that million dollars is spent, and we're well. We have an cool. ongoing uh, right now. Scott Lindeback is our stormwater engineer. You know, he used to work <coughs> for do True. that for them. Yeah. Uh, but we've had a conversation, you know, for decades with them about what the plan is. It got really more intense uh, eight or ten years ago when the first accreditation came up and this kind of new standard for what you had to uh, to make sure you could provide. But uh, Scott, in fact, he's been on the phone with them this week because of various yeah. issues out there. People call us that should call them, vice versa. And so, right. um, but we did go through, as Lindsay said, uh, a year ago, a pretty intense uh, exercise with them, and we got a... Uh, a third 25 30 year plan uh, those change but we're doing a five-year plan this is a short short range and uh, we've discussed in the CIP committee that we need to come back in a year or two and, and revisit that long-range plan with them and make sure we're on the right track right okay thanks the other uh, is there a time when we suggest that there might be some other things on the horizon anytime you want we would love to hear from you well, right I, now would be lovely if you I, have them. And I don't know that, that this would be um, totally a CIP. Obviously, it would be a, a, a TBD as far as cost, but there might be. We've had there have been some preliminary discussions about the expansion of the National Center for Aviation Training campus, but likely it could be paid by by the operate you know by the operating revenue of the of the school of WSU Tech itself, okay. but it might be on the watch list. Okay. Um, again, not knowing a number, I don't think they would know either. The other thing is I think we might get approached uh, in the near future by the city of Wichita to help uh, participate with some finishing touches or finishing things at the uh, all the, the, the baseball complex that's going on right now. That wouldn't be on a future watch list. That would, if they approach us, it'd be. That would be pretty soon. Rather immediate, <laughs> right? But I don't know that that's. I just throwing that out there. That I know that I'm aware of. Okay. And would that be a project that would be on our list, or we would just be asked to give funding toward, or? <clears throat> I don't know yet. I don't, okay. I don't know for sure. I don't even know if they will approach us or not. Okay. okay. Anything else before we go to roads and bridges? I got a question on Mr. Spears. You got uh, 19 minutes before noon. Or what? What's your plan here? I think we can get through it in 19 minutes. 19 minutes. All right. All right. You're on the clock. Try. <laughs> we can All do right. That yeah. David Spears, Director of Public Works. Well, what what's the schedule? Uh, this afternoon more CIP at one I know that and then a wrap-up and then we have half hour session of discussion slash wrap-up yeah. do you just want to do it then do you want to... mm -hmm. uh, we all have a three o'clock wrap vote also okay well that's fine if, if yeah, we, let's plow through we can do I mean do the 30 minute wrap-up now or after lunch after lunch well, we haven't wrapped up yet, so we yes. got we gotta get through it. You're down to 18 minutes, David. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing my best. <laughs> all right, we have 600 miles of roads, as all of you know, 600 bridges, 13,000 signs. Project categories are that we maintain, we enhance, we expand, and we have quality of place. So to maintain, one of the biggest things we do is preventive maintenance to our roads. As you know, a road gets something done to it every six years. And then we have replacement with like infrastructure. Then replacements may include minor enhancements. And then most bridge replacements maintain the system. Now there's times when we don't go back. If it's a two lane bridge, if it's like close to a little city, or uh, maybe more traffic's coming on it. You got to remember, a bridge will last 50 years, so you got to kind of look into the future. So sometimes we'll make a instead of a two-lane bridge, go to a four-lane. Sometimes we'll put a sidewalk on one side. Sometimes we'll put a sidewalk on both sides. But those instances are not real often. Uh, I don't want to say they're rare, but we have we have done that. So that's examples of where you might do a little extra. 
To enhance means to relieve bottlenecks, improve safety, and add capacity. And to expand means to add significant capacity and to create new routes. In other words, what we're trying to do there is relieve congestion. Then, of course, quality of place. Uh, you have your bicycle, pedestrian facilities, and then park and public space infrastructure. And we are real big on the Sedgwick County Park and helping there all we can with bicycle paths and uh, other things. And we're glad to do that. Uh, might mention Mr. Weber. He told me today that he spoke to a bicycle club last night. Bicycle club or bicycle? Bicycle Advisory Board just last night. Okay, so goals, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, uh, preventing maintenance on roads every six years. That means we must treat about 210 lane miles. So uh, if you figure uh, a two lane road uh, for a mile, that's two lane miles. So it's about 100, 105 two lane roads. So we do have some four lane. That's why that figures there for lane miles. Uh, we replace bridges every 50 years, which means we need to do 12 per year, either by contract or county forces. We make up for it. Whatever we don't do by contract, we make up for with our county forces, or at least we try to. Okay, so R134's right away in utility relocation for uh, $1 million, and this is over a five-year span, all, the, all these numbers. R175 is our preventing maintenance on the roads every six years, so there's $47.5 million on that over five years. R264, miscellaneous drainage projects, which we use every bit of that money every year. Just like right now, Scott Lindeback is very busy out looking at Drainage problems in the entire county and replace will be replacing culverts. We had a problem over by one of the uh, fire stations. They met out there today, by the way, Rusty, um, and and looking at a bad situation there that we're going to fix. Uh, so uh, we we use all of that miscellaneous miscellaneous drainage money each year. Then we have traffic control, mainly that striping that we do on the roads. <coughs> So, we also maintain the bridge system. In the next five years, we're going to have four major bridge repairs. Now, it's not replacement, that's repairs for $8.63 million. That'll be Ridge Road over the Ark, uh, Bentley Road over the Ark River, uh, 63rd Street South, still over the Ark Kansas River, and then Zoo Boulevard over MS Mitchell Floodway. All of those are repairs and not replacements. Uh, then we're going to have 25 bridge replacements for $26.715 million. Uh, you can see on the summary sheet, too, uh, I, th I think, it w Lindsay, I think you had us add the uh, sufficiency ratings on, on all that. She's not here. Oh, you're behind me. I'm Okay. Uh, so we, we added that on there. You can see those. So if it's under 50, it needs to be replaced. There are just two or three over, and that's probably for these repairs. So a total of 29 bridge projects over the next five years. Also, we enhance the road system. Um, R348, we're going to pave 135th Street West from 53rd Street North to the railroad track to serve a Mays Industrial Park. That's about $1.4 million, and I believe that's slated for next year. Uh, R350, county roads, this is to repair our coal mix roads, which is not nearly enough money to do it, but it's $1.5 million each year, so it's $7.5 million. Um, R351, intersection improvements at 55th Street South and Meridian. Uh, this is a project that we're partnering with the uh, high school. They're going to pay part of the through specials of the uh, turn lanes there, and then we are also going to put in a signal at 55th and Meridian. And that's next year. will start in May and get finished before the school year starts. That's the goal. Then R353, uh, this uh, is in Commissioner Cruz's district, uh, shoulders on Ridge Road from 53rd to 69th, and then also shoulders, can't do it all at once, it's kind of expensive. It's, this is a safety deal, we've had some problems out there, and we think it's an important uh, project to do, 
and you can see we've split that up there going all the way up to 85th Street North from 53rd. So, uh, also the big pro expand the road system. Uh, Northwest Bypass right now, as you know, we're just doing right away with the state. It's a $1 for us, $1 for them. We have a con contract with them, an agreement for $325,000. Um, the actual, the 2020 will be the last year for that. And uh, also I want to mention that Goddard puts in $3,000 and Mays puts in $2,500. And then KDOT matches all of us. We put in three twenty-five. dollars And then they have contacted us. They want to talk about the future after next year. And right now we just put in three twenty-five dollars a year. We assume that's what they want to stick with, but you don't know. We will ask them to do two-to-one, which they used to do years ago, and see where we get with that. Quality of place, um, the, the, the piece of the aviation pathway we didn't finish because we couldn't get the right of way from the machinist union before. We're still working on that and we hope to have that, get, get that finished. Now, before I go, not on your slides, just want to mention two other projects that came up late in the process. They are not in the CIP. One of them is 71st Street South between Greenwich Road and Cook Airfield. This is in Commissioner Howell's district. Uh, we have uh, uh, done just a rough ballpark estimate. The road, it, it's very narrow. It's, it's lower than some of the, the fields by it. Uh, the roadbed's going to have to be completely redone uh, with what we call rock and tensar. And then there's also a rural water district line that has to be really located for a couple hundred thousand dollars. The right of way is narrow. We figure you have to buy about three hundred fifty thousand dollars of right of way, and so this project is looking like roughly it's going to be over two million dollars. It's about a mile and a half of two lane. We did not put that in the CIP. The other one that came up was Pawnee between 119th and 183rd and actually uh, 119th and 135th is in the city of Wichita. We had a meeting about that. One of the council members is wanting to go four lanes on that and I must tell you that we have uh, 50, I had Mark Bors look at the traffic counts throughout the county. We have 50 other roads with higher traffic than Pawnee that you would go to four lanes before you would Pawnee and uh, the city is in agreement with us on this, the engineering staff, and uh, right now your count out there is about 1,800 cars a day. You need to get around the threshold of 10,000 cars a day to go to four lane. So we did not put that in the CIP either. I just wanted to mention those two. Before we went on to the county expenditure pie chart. You can see what the bulk maintain roads is the uh, brightest uh, blue there, 43 million. Uh, maintain bridges 34 million, enhance 14 million, expand 1 million, and then quality of place 300,000. Then the next slide shows just it's just the percentages of that same thing. You can see the percentages. I don't have to say them all, I don't think. So the five-year summary and a couple of these uh, we had to uh, fix this morning. Uh, total county expenditure. This is the county expenditure only. Ninety-three million, uh, eighty-three point three percent to maintain roads and bridges. Fifteen point two to enhance. One point two to expand, and point three to improve quality of place. And this chart shows all funding sources. That includes federal exchange funds, sales tax bonds, other, other could be a partner, partnership with other communities. And so you can see, you can't see, but you, you can see each year how far it goes, but the total of that is $106,061,000. So the comprehensive plan, the CIP must be reviewed by MAPC for consistency with the city county comprehensive plan to make sure we're not doing anything wrong. Uh, the review dates, the advanced plans committee look at it July 11th and then the full MAPC will see it July 25th. Now we're finished with my part. It would be, it would go back to Lindsay. Uh, if you have no questions or you want to break for lunch and come back or whatever you want to do, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Thank you.
And Miss Lindsay, how long is your portion? Depends on <laughs> how mad you guys get at me. <laughs> uh, it's not long. There's yeah, three minutes. slides. So you want to go give it a shot? Can you get it done in seven minutes? Yes. All right. Okay. Said we'd go to noon. Okay, so the CIP funding plan, um, of course, is guided by your debt policy. Uh, we have talked a little bit about that most recently when we talked about the property tax lid. Of course, our preference is to pay as you go, meaning cash as much as possible. We do have a formal structure for um, when we look at our debt service, our debt issues, the way we pay debt. Uh, it establishes a number of benchmarks that we have also talked about quite a bit, so I will go into those if you'd like me to. Um, but otherwise, what you need to know is that this policy allow or this proposal allows us to stick with that plan. Uh, we do try and pay off our principal, 30% uh, of our principal within the first five years and 60% in the first 10 years. We typically structure over 20 years for our normal debt, so that means we have paid off more than half of it, uh, which helps us reduce our interest costs in the final 10 years. And so um, there are lots and lots of uh, best practice guidelines and policies uh, that we follow when we issue debt. So and if you have questions about those, we can get into them. So again, for facilities and drainage, uh, we had a total of $37.1 million in requests. Of that, about $6.6 .6 million is cash, $30.5 million is debt, and again, the biggest single piece of that is the county administration building. For roads and bridges, you just heard from David uh, the different mixture of road projects and bridge projects. Some of those are funded with sales tax cash. That's what you'll see represented in that cash line, $73 million over the five-year cycle. Debt of $20 million, that comes back to that $4 million per year for the bridge replacements that he talked about. There's another $13 million of funding that Public Works is counting on for their projects. And so that brings the road and bridge portion to $106.1 million. So overall, the total tentative CIP uh, is comprised of $143.1 million, of which, of course, you can see the bulk is for infrastructure, that road and bridge. So I do have a slide for questions, um, but the five will refer you to your final slide in your packet if you're interested in the debt service. Um, and this just is kind of anecdotal information on what that debt service would look like uh, by project as we proposed it. Uh, but not necessarily anything I want to delve into the details on unless you just really want me to. Very good. Commissioner Meitzner. Lindsay, thanks. <clears throat> this sheet here? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is easy to understand. Can you walk? I can. That? I will. Lines 41 to 51. Tell me the relevance and what I'm looking at here. Well, I will tell you it has some relevance because I want to show you the difference in um, what was proposed in February in our forecast versus now, but I will tell you that this is still incomplete information before I get into the details okay. because all this right. does not have all the other decisions that you'll be making. But what this okay. attempts to show is that first section 41 through 43 tells you that in terms of what we were funding with cash, that line 41 says here's how much we thought we were going to spend on that in that year in the forecast that you saw back in February at your retreat. Now, based on what you saw today in row 42, you can see how much we say we're gonna spend in cash. And so you can see the difference. Um, if it's a positive number, that means that's a good thing. It positively impacts the forecast. If it's a negative number, that means that it further um, increases a, a potential deficit for that year. So then rows 44 through 47 are similar information, but on the debt service side. So you can see what we forecasted to spend in debt service in February versus what this plan would include. Then you can see that we do intend to get some cash. We talked about the household hazardous waste, that solid waste fee already pays some portion of cash to offset our debt service. 911 tax fund does the same thing. We talked about uh, debt funding that portion. So you can see that revenue would be coming into what otherwise is a property tax supported fund and mitigates the impact to that fund. So 47 shows you that impact. And then rows 48 through 51 take all of that together and show you overall what the impact is to the current forecast um, from what we had included before. 
But again, this is not a complete picture. Um, really, when this will, the rubber will meet the road on this is when we talk to you about it during the recommended budget, because that's when we'll talk about the compensation and the TRB and the decision packages and all that. That's what I was saying. What <clears throat> the CIP does have an impact on the compensation uh, it, package? Not only to the extent of cash? that it's all competing priorities for right. the same bucket of money. Okay. And so that's one of the things that we're also kind of trying to frame for the discussion this afternoon with our wrap-up session is how many okay. demands this budget cycle does have on it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? I don't see any other questions. Five minutes so before noon. Before noon. All right, back at uh, 1 o'clock to talk about CIP again. Actually, we're done with CIP. We'll talk about wrap-up at that yeah. point. Sorry. Woo! 110. What? 110. 110? Okay. 110. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Approximately 110. Around a minute after.